Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if neglected Naruto was sent in One Punch Man. Before I start, please support for more amazing content and do consider subscribing to my channel and share this video with your friends. This is written by Redyoshi14 link in the description and support writer. Let's start the video. One Hit Ninja, there's something to be said about being too strong. Once you have the ability to do anything you want, you find that you don't really want to do anything. Naruto was never what you would call smart. He didn't pick up on things as easily as the other students in his school. His teachers would often have to explain things to him in a unique way as to make it entertain him. Most of the time they failed, and so Naruto never really kept pace with his fellow students. As such, even though he was several years younger than them, Naruto would have to keep his head down as he watched his fellow classmates graduate without him. Dad, I just want to say goodbye. A young girl with blonde hair yelled. She had the prettiest blue eyes that Naruto had ever seen. His own were blue and much brighter, but Naruto had never found the same joy in looking at his own eyes. No, her father responded. His eyes, blue like the young girl's, were mean. They were hard and sharp like knives. It hurt Naruto to look into them, so he looked away. He could still hear the man, though. He wasn't that far away from where all the graduated students were being held. That boy is a he's a monster. Little Naruto? The girl asked. Her name was Aiko. Naruto made sure to remember that her name was spelled with an I. Little Naruto couldn't harm a fly. He can't even learn the clone technique. Naruto couldn't see the man, but he could feel the man's glare. The young blonde boy scrunched his eyes shut and tried to ignore it, like he did in the village. It was harder now, though. Aiko was there. Aiko would be able to see that he was hated. Aiko would hate him too. I don't care what you say, Dad. I'm going to say bye to little Naruto. I'm not going to be in the academy anymore, and there won't be anyone to look after him. Naruto heard the grass crunch. There was a lot of grass in the schoolyard, and the wildest of it grew near the old swing set where the blonde boy currently sat. To be honest, it wasn't a swing set so much as a wooden plank tied up with rope to a tree branch. It was the only swing on the yard, though. It was where Naruto felt he could be comfortably alone. He used to play with kids on the swing. They would stop playing when they learned the cool ninja techniques. Somehow being able to walk on walls and turn into other things was way more fun than a stupid old swing. Naruto tried to learn those techniques too. He hadn't succeeded yet. Listen, Aiko. I told you to leave the boy alone. You will do as I say. The father hissed. The ground near the unruly grass crunched and whined. Naruto could tell there was a scuffle going on. He didn't dare look up, though. Dad, stop. You're hurting me Naruto's heart hurt. His chest hurt and clenched when he heard Aiko's voice sound so afraid. She was always so happy and cheerful. Was this how she acted with her parents? Were parents like this to their children? Hey, you leave her alone, you big jerk. A crass voice called out. Naruto recognized that voice. It was Kaiben, the biggest boy in their class. Kaiben had really wild hair that looked scruffy, no matter how he tried to comb it. His teeth, specifically his canines, and his nails were always so sharp, his eyes were also so fierce, it always looked like he wanted to fight. Because of this he was the bully of the school. No one ever challenged him, and everyone did as he said. He never told Naruto what to do, though. Kaiben was always nice to Naruto. He was always nice to Aiko, too. Naruto often wondered if the two facts were related. Aiko's father grunted. Back off, boy. I am her father. I can tell her whatever I want. Why, you Kaiben growled. That was another weird thing about Kaiben. He growled when he was angry. He was like a dog. I oughta. You ought to what, exactly? Aiko's dad asked. There was a challenging tone in his voice, and for a second Naruto was afraid that Kaiben would fight Aiko's dad. Kaiben was good and strong, but he wasn't as big as Aiko's dad. Finally, Naruto decided to look up and was immediately relieved. He ought to do nothing, a woman responded. She looked an awful lot like Kaiben, except much wilder. And bigger. Especially around the chest. She placed a hand on Kaiben's head and ruffled his hair. Kaiben, didn't I tell you not to mess with these Yamanaka folk? Their heads are all messed up from messing with other people's heads. Aiko's father didn't look pleased. His mouth twisted and for a second Naruto thought he looked like a demon. He closed his eyes and then breathed in and out very slowly. Finally, after a couple seconds, Aiko's dad opened his eyes and glared at the woman behind Kaiben. Insults and vulgarity from an Inuzuka. Why am I not surprised? Because all you headhunters do is spy on people. I wouldn't be surprised if you knew what color panties I were wearing right now. Knowing you savages, Aiko's father started with a sneer, you probably aren't wearing any. See? Kaiben's sister chirped. Peeping perverts, the lot of you. Right on target, ace. Aiko's father gasped. He looked affronted. Shaking his head, he placed a hand on his daughter's shoulder and made to pull her away. Come, Aiko. You don't need to be in this cesspool of depravity any longer. Aiben's sister laughed. 
Those are an awful lot of hundred yen words for a degenerate pervert. Aiko's dad stiffened, but he didn't turn around to respond. He kept pulling Aiko away. This made Kaiban's sister laugh even harder. Come on Kaiban. Let's get out of here. With that, Kaiban turned to follow his sister off the school grounds. As Aiko and Kaiban were pulled in opposite directions, Naruto couldn't help but notice the way they looked back at each other. Though he couldn't tell why, the way that they looked at each other made Naruto's chest hurt even more. I hope I'm on your team, Aiko. Kaiban called across the school ground. Aiko didn't say anything, but she did turn around. The tears in her eyes reflected the afternoon sun, but they did nothing to dim the smile she had on her face. She nodded so hard that Naruto thought her head would fall off. Apparently that was enough for Kaiban, because he flashed a toothy sharp smile and nodded back. Aiko and her father disappeared from the school ground shortly afterwards. Seeing one of his only friends gone, Naruto had made to putting his head back down. No, wait big sis. There's someone I have to talk to first. Before he could notice, Kaiban was standing before him on the swing. Normally Naruto would be able to hear the grass crunching and tell when someone was coming. This day was really weighing down on him if the loud Kaiban could sneak up on him. I know you don't talk, much. Kaiban started. He was always so blunt. So you don't have to say nothing. I'll just talk, okay? Naruto nodded. This was standard practice between them. I never really liked you, Naruto Kaiban said. Naruto's eyes widened, but he didn't do anything else. It wasn't surprising, but typical. No one really liked him. But you always hung on to Aiko. I couldn't be her friend without being yours too. Naruto nodded. He had expected as much. He was a slow learner for school stuff, but he could read people pretty easily. They either hated you or pretended that they didn't. Or they were Aiko, but Aiko was gone now. But over time, you grew on me. Naruto, who had been expecting to be chewed out, looked up at Kaiban. Now that it surprised him. I mean, you're just a little kid, right? But everyone is always so hard on you. The big dogs in my house weren't even that hard on me when I was your age, and they were hard on everyone. Not knowing what to say, Naruto just stared. I'm not good with words, Kaiban continued, so I'll just say it. I like your guts, little Naruto. I started protecting you cause it made Aiko happy, but after a while I just couldn't stand other people making things harder for you than they already were. Kaiban then went silent. He appeared to be choosing his words carefully. Listen, I won't be here any longer, but you will be. You have to be strong. Don't let them bully you, okay? Naruto nodded. They would be bullying him just about as soon as Kaiban left, but the scruffy boy didn't need to know that. I will be a strong ninja, the strongest. I'll become the Hokage, then I'll come back for you, okay? Can you wait for me? Naruto nodded. That would be a very long time. He would be kicked out of the academy if he failed again. He would probably be gone before Kaiban even made it to Chunin rank. Then this isn't goodbye, okay little Naruto. Kaiban held out a fist. See you later. Naruto smiled. It wasn't his real smile, but he had to fool Kaiban. See you later, the blonde said. Kaiban smiled and nodded. Then he was gone, and Naruto was alone on the school swing once more. He heard the remaining graduates and their parents as they whispered at him. The words didn't hurt, but they weren't nice to listen to either. With a huff, Naruto rose from his seat on the swing and walked away from the academy. There was no reason for him to be here anymore. The village hidden in the leaves was the biggest city in the Land of Fire. The Land of Fire was the biggest country in the Elemental Nations. The Elemental Nations was the biggest empire in the world. Yet, for all of that, it hardly ever rained where Naruto lived. Yet today, like some kind of divine joke, it started to rain in the village hidden in the leaves. The driest city in the Land of Fire. The Land of Fire was the driest country in the Elemental Nations, and so on. Naruto found himself where he usually did whenever something happened that was beyond his control. He was alone beneath a tree watching the rain slide down the leaves above him on down to the ground. This tree was on the outskirts of the city, but not quite outside of its boundaries. It sat on a tall hill just far enough away from the buildings that Naruto could see over pretty much the entire village. The academy, which was pretty close to the monument, was a sight he avoided. The monument, however, was not. It was a large overbearing quartet of faces that overlooked the village. Born into the cliff that the village was situated under, it sported the stern faces of the four previous Hokage. Naruto liked the fourth Hokage the best. He looked like a hero. Would Kaiban be up there one day, too? Naruto shrugged. The Hokage were none of his business. It's not like they had any real bearing on his life. Instead Naruto let his eyes rove over the various buildings in the village. Some were tall, like the Hokage tower that dominated the center of the town. Others were small, like the post office where all the carrier doves flew, or the weapons shop that allowed him to take home some shuriken to practice with. The girl there, her name was Tenten, had really pretty hair. She always smiled at him when he came in and sometimes gave him candy. Naruto loved going there, but with Tenten going to the academy too, he never had enough time to spend with her. 
Her father obliged when he could, but he had a shop to run, so Naruto made sure not to disturb them too often. No, the favorite small shop that the young blonde liked to visit was definitely the Raymond shop. Naruto couldn't pronounce the name of the shop yet, but he knew where to find it in the village. Even though it was small, maybe the smallest of all the buildings in the village, it gave off this warmth that was hard to replace. The owners were these two nice people, a father and daughter. Whenever he went there they would smile at him and give him food. Sometimes it would be all that he ate. Naruto had wanted to go there to eat after school. He had wandered too much, however, and by the time that he realized that he was near the edge of the village it had started to rain. He couldn't run through the rain, not without getting absolutely wet. He didn't have a dryer, so he would be wet all night. He didn't want to catch a cold. Naruto held out a hand into the rain. The droplets fell onto his fingertips hard and fast. It didn't rain often in the village hidden in the leaves, but when it did, it rained hard. It had been raining for almost an hour now, and it didn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. Naruto would miss the Raymond shop today. He would have to eat tomorrow. But the sigh, the young blonde boy sat with his back against a tree. His stomach growled at him, but he closed his eyes and drowned out his hunger with the rhythmic pitter-patter of the rain. It worked, well almost worked, and for a while Naruto thought that he could sleep there. Then the voice called out to him. You're a pathetic runt, the boy said. It was deep, but oddly smooth. The baritone voice wasn't particularly loud, but it drowned out the din of the rain. I was hoping that you would be more impressive by the time that I woke up. I can't say I'm particularly disappointed. You humans never live up to expectations. Naruto, rather than be offended, simply tilted his head. He looked around himself, head darting left and right in order to find the person speaking to him. He saw no one under the tree, but him, so he started looking over the village again. You're not going to find me, the boy said. Naruto looked around again. I just said that you won't find me. Rather than keep looking around, Naruto shrugged and sat back down. You go along with the flow too often, child, the boy said. I was expecting some resistance. Your kind is typically confrontational. Naruto shrugged again. He started to play with the dirt under his sandals. No one else is here. You can talk. Unwana, Naruto finally responded. Naruto wasn't sure how, but he could feel the voice's glee. Oh, so you can talk. Why don't you wanna? Naruto, instead of responding again, just shrugged his shoulders. They'll joy, the voice mumbled. You'll talk to me eventually. Maybe, Naruto responded. He waited for a bit, but whoever it was that was talking to him wasn't talking anymore. Had he gone away? Probably. He seemed eager to talk to Naruto, but he wasn't Aiko, which meant that he was only pretending to like him. Naruto hated those kinds of people the most. But the sigh, Naruto stood up and walked out into the rain. It was still pouring hard, but staying here wasn't going to solve anything either. If he ran fast enough, maybe he could get back to his apartment. Overhead, lightning lit up the sky. When it rained in the hidden leaf, it was a solemn affair. Too used to the dry conditions, the people of Fire Country usually didn't have emergency conditions for a sudden downpour. As such, the streets were now empty. All of the citizens of the Hidden Leaf were now sequestered away inside some house or store and waiting out the storm. Everyone, of course, except for Naruto. The blonde boy was walking rapidly through the streets. His orange shirt was soaked through, and so was his pants. His sandals made a plop 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 sound as he rushed onward past roads and roads. His normally spiky hair was now matted down onto his head, and every inch of his body glistened from rainwater. Naruto's face was deadpan. It was usually deadpan, but now it showed just a bit of discomfort. Stupid rain, Naruto mumbled. A barking sound echoed in his ears. Tell me about it. Like each time the voice had done so before, Naruto ignored the voice's provocation. He wasn't sure where exactly the voice was to be able to be heard so clearly in this rain on this empty street, but he would ignore it. It would go away eventually. I'm not going anywhere, brat. Even if I could, you're the only brat in this hellhole worth talking to. Naruto decided to ignore the voice. Turning a corner, the boy saw his apartment building up ahead. Finding renewed energy, the boy ran the last couple yards to his front door. He took the stairs two at a time, before darting down the hall. When he came to his door, he pulled out his keys and fumbled with the lock. After a bit of fumbling, Naruto realized that his key wasn't fitting. Very faintly, both through walls and over the patter of the rain, the sound of his grouchy landlord cackling could be heard. She had changed his locks once more, and he would have to wait until the rain let up before he would even try to brave the way all the way to the Hokage Tower. He was dripping rainwater onto the walkway floors. It was an outside walkway too, so it was cold too. Bracing his back against the door. Naruto felt himself get sleepy. Brat, don't go to sleep, the boy said. Naruto wanted to look for it, he did, but he was just so tired. Maybe he could just close his eyes for a second. Brat, the voice continued. It sounded like it was panicking. I just told you not to go to sleep. You were out in the rain too long. Can't you feel yourself shivering? He couldn't. 
Actually, he couldn't feel anything at all. Except sleepy. He felt extremely sleepy. Against his will his eyes began to droop. Brat. The voice yelled. Keep your damn eyes open. Naruto didn't respond, not even with his thoughts. His eyes drifted closed and he felt the tranquility of sleep wash over his body. Then he felt blinding, overwhelming pain. Naruto screamed as something akin to lava bubbled all over his skin. I told you to stay awake, brat. The voice said. Look what you made me do. Naruto could indeed look at what was happening. Some weird red liquid was bubbling out of his skin. It looked like a combination of some kind of jelly and water. It bubbled every so often and every inch of it that touched him both burned and stung him. Force it down, boy. The voice yelled. Naruto didn't know who it was, but he seemed concerned. Wasn't he the one to do this to him? Don't question things. Just force the chakra back down. So that's what this is. Chakra. Wasn't chakra supposed to be warm and comforting? This chakra felt unbearably hot and painful. Listen brat, if you don't stop questioning things you're going to die. Just ignore the pain and push the chakra back. Ignore the pain. He was 10 years old. I don't care. Push it back. You can do it. It hurt. Not as much as it's going to hurt when you die. Did things still hurt after death? I don't know. Maybe. Stop distracting me and push. Naruto screamed. The red chakra was peeling away at his skin. Okay, the voice pleaded. Maybe you don't know how to push chakra. I understand. This is your first time experiencing chakra. That's not your fault. I'm going to try something, okay? I want you to play close attention. Naruto screamed once more. There was a bestial quality to it. Okay, maybe try to do it through the pain. Naruto grit his teeth. The pain had by now spread over almost his entire body. It stretched over his entire body like a second skin, and soon he was expecting the lava-like chakra to engulf his head as well. Just as it reached his neck, however, it stopped. Kid, the voice gasped. It sounded to be an immense concentration. Do you feel that? Do you feel what's happening to the chakra? Naruto nodded. His throat was raspy from the screaming. I'm pulling it. I don't have time to explain, but that chakra belongs inside of you. The voice then hesitated. With me. The chakra belonged inside of him. Wait, the voice was inside of him. Do you feel me pulling the chakra back in? Naruto nodded. I can't pull it back on my own. I'm going to need your help. Naruto nodded again. He could feel the chakra pulling, and he tried to apply the sensation, but in reverse. That's it, the voice cooed. I can feel the pull getting easier. Keep it up. Naruto took a deep breath, then tried to latch onto the ethereal feeling of pain. Mentally he tried to will the pain down deeper, to a place under his skin. At first it was difficult, incomprehensibly so, but as he pushed it got easier. That's it, boy. Keep it up. Naruto did. He pushed and pushed, until he was sure that his mind was giving out. After a while the pain subsided, and Naruto reluctantly opened his eyes. The lava chakra was gone, and instead he was left with slightly burnt skin. That was interesting. The boy said. Are you okay? Naruto shook his head. At least you're warm now. Naruto nodded. Is that all I'm going to get out of you? Naruto shrugged. The voice laughed. I'll take it. For now, sleep. I'll make sure that you stay warm. Naruto nodded. His eyes slowly closed, willingly this time, and for the first time in a while the boy felt calm going to sleep. After a few minutes passed, the landlady unbolted her door and peeked out. The screaming that she heard chilled her to her bones, and as curious as she was, she could not move. Frozen to her chair, the landlady waited until the screaming ended. She waited for 10 minutes. Now that it was over, the lady snuck out to where she imagined the source to be, only to find the scourge of her life. That blonde brat was sleeping outside his door. From the looks of it, his skin was burned and charred in places. Was that why he was screaming? Because someone had burned him. Good for nothing runt, the woman grunted. She reached down to him, only for a bubbly red substance to jump out of the boy's skin and burn her. She recoiled and almost made to scream before she realized that the red stuff wasn't attacking her. It was protecting the boy. The woman, old by anyone's standards, looked at the boy with a soft eye. We did this to you, didn't we? She reached down once more only to see the bubbly red substance swipe at her. We pushed you to rely on the demon. I am sorry, child. The lady made her way around the boy, careful not to disturb him in any way. Upon reaching his door, she pulled out the newly made key from her rope pocket and unlocked the door. After pushing it open, the lady turned to look at Naruto again. You're just a boy. Or a demon. You could be either for all I know. Naruto hadn't responded, but the chakra that surrounded him receded just a bit. I don't know, the woman sighed. But for the sake of my humanity I'm going to trust that you're a boy, just this once. She reached down to pick up Naruto once more and, reluctantly, the red substance led her. Struggling only a little, the old lady carried Naruto inside and dropped him on the ratty old sofa in his living room. She put the key on his kitchen counter on the way out and stopped at the open door. 
I don't trust you, demon, the old landlady said. You killed a whole bunch of my friends. She then looked down at her leg. Even now she walked on it with a limp. You took away my ninja career. The lady then looked back at the sleeping blonde boy. And now you're taking the life of an innocent boy. Or what used to be a boy. I don't know. But I'm going to give you a chance. The old lady then slowly closed the door. Please don't make me regret my decision. The sleeping Naruto didn't answer, but the bubbly red chakra fully receded back into his body. Naruto woke with a start. He was inside his apartment again. Are you awake, child? Naruto didn't respond. Instead, he got up and stretched. Last he remembered he was locked out of his house again. So we're doing the silent game again? That's fine. You were under a lot of stress last night, I understand. The voice then yawned. Your new key is over there, by their way. Naruto, somehow knowing where the voice was indicating, looked over to his kitchen counter and saw his new key sitting there. She delivered it last night after carrying you in here. The voice then went silent. She seems to think that I am you. Who are you? Naruto finally asked. The voice was silent. It seemed to be thinking. Naruto didn't know how he knew that. She seemed to think that you are a monster that attacked the village 10 years ago. Naruto tilted his head. Something attacked the village 10 years ago. Not drawing any answers, he walked into the kitchen. He pulled out the milk container and started drinking. The voice grumbled. She seemed to think that you were the nine-tailed fox. Naruto nodded. Everyone thought he was a monster. The blonde boy spit milk all over his floor. You're the nine-tailed fox. Naruto screamed. So you can speak. The fox yelled back. I was starting to think that you were a mute. You're the nine-tailed fox. Naruto repeated. The fox scoffed. Yes, I'm the fox. Are you done, yet? Naruto nodded. He hardly ever screamed, so doing so twice was enough to calm him down. Good. Now let's get down to business. Naruto tilted his head. We're going training. That last time was a full power chakra cloak, and we couldn't handle that. But because we went into using my chakra so fast, you are now more susceptible to it. I can even manifest a bit of it outside of your body now. To prove its point, a tendril of chakra snaked out of Naruto's stomach. It waved at him before going back in. I can control that one, though. It won't hurt you unless you piss me off. Naruto made a note to never piss the fox off. I can control that much, but if you pull on the chakra, even unconsciously, I won't be able to stop all of it from harming you from the seal. Naruto coughed. I'm sealed inside of you. Naruto's eyes widened. You are a creepy, expressionless little boy. You know that right? Naruto nodded. Oh well. We have to prevent you from harming yourself if you accidentally pull on my power again. You can't even call on your own chakra yet. Naruto nodded. The fox made sense. We leave to train now. Naruto looked at his clock. It was stupid o'clock in the morning. Naruto shook his head rapidly. Let's get going. A tendril of chakra burst out of Naruto's back and whipped him. Naruto squealed. Go. Oh. Naruto darted out the door. He grabbed his new key as an afterthought and scrambled out to the forest. We're going to start with 100 sit-ups, 100 pull-ups, 100 squats, and 100 kilometers of running. We'll increase it as you get better. Naruto groaned. This was going to be a long week. Week. This is going on until you can handle my chakra. Maybe afterwards. Now move. The fox then whipped him again for emphasis. Naruto started running even faster. He ran past the landlady's door at speed. The old woman looked out her window. Shitty brat, the woman grunted. Regardless she had a smile on her face as she closed her door. Little did anyone know that this was going to be the start of a reluctant legend. Naruto plopped down in his chair. The academy was never a favorite spot of his, and the seats were by far his least favorite part of it. They were so damn uncomfortable. You spend your days training non-stop in a forest and sleeping on rocks, yet a chair discomforts you. The voice in his head, the nine-tailed fox, asked. Naruto nodded, though his head was still lying on the table. You're still a creepy little shit. Naruto nodded again. As per usual, Naruto was the first to arrive to class, though it was not for any particular reason. After training out in the various training grounds located all over the hidden leaf, he would fall asleep rather late and wake up rather early. There wasn't much to do other than clean up and head to school. Could you at least endeavor yourself to remember their names this time? The fox asked. Naruto shook his head. This was actually Naruto's second year since he met the fox. He had failed the academy once more during that time. The third Hokage had managed to convince the teachers to give him one more try. Turns out that simply not showing up for class wasn't a good enough reason to bar him entry to being a ninja. The third Hokage made him promise to show up to class this time. Naruto couldn't bring himself to deny the man. You spent all of last year training. You're more than strong enough now to take care of yourself. Maybe you should focus on making friends. Naruto lifted his head. The classroom was still empty, so the blonde boy had no problems with voicing his opinion. You're a giant beast of pure malevolence. Why do you care if I make friends or not? 
The fox grunted. It'd be an interesting change of pace. I'd like to see you squirm as you struggle to do the one thing that has always evaded you. Successfully socializing with another human being. Naruto shrugged. The kids here are all so boring. How do you know that? The fox asked. You haven't even met them yet. I met the kids last year, Naruto stated. They were super boring. Well, they might not be as bad this year. Just give them a chance. No, Naruto said. He started to pout. There are only two kinds of people in this world. Those who hate you, and those who pretend that they don't. Naruto then hesitated. And Aiko. Every time you say that line, you mention this Aiko person. Who is she? The fox asked. None of your business, Naruto responded. He put his head down. The fox scoffed. Whenever the boy got like this, he would stop talking altogether. If it makes you feel any better, the fox started, I'm only a part of the group that hates you. Naruto, despite his best efforts, smiled. The first student strolled in only a half hour after Naruto did. They were still a half hour early for class. Naruto sat in a corner of the room at the back of the class. He was next to a window, so he could enjoy being as far away from public attention as possible. The person chose the seat farthest away from him while still being near the back of the class. After choosing their seat, the person immediately followed suit and plopped their head down on the desk. Naruto recognized this person. Too bad it didn't matter. Shikamaru Nara fell asleep almost as soon as his head hit the table. I remember the Naras. They're cheeky little shits. In the olden days of the clan wars, the Naras were hired almost as much as the Senju and those other people. Naruto knew that the fox meant the Achiha he also knew that the fox hated the Achiha. They're smart little bugs. Maybe you should be his friend. Immediately after the nine-tailed fox said that, Shikamaru started to snore. Or maybe not. Five minutes or so afterwards the next student strolled in. He was chubbier than most other students that Naruto saw, and thus singled out the only family the kid could have come from. An Akamichi. You had one last year. They're a jolly bunch. True to form, the Akamichi waved at Naruto before sitting down next to Shikamaru. The boy attempted to rouse his sleeping friend to no avail. He then shrugged, opened a bag of chips, and started eating. Apparently, this was the status quo. I'll consider it, Naruto whispered. The fox grunted. The next person to arrive showed up only minutes after the rot on boy. He had charcoal black hair and, no. You are not making friends with that boy. No making friends with Sasuke No problems there. The next person to enter had arrived with an escort. The escort bowed as the small girl entered the room and watched her like a hawk until the girl had sat down near the back. Both escort and girl had pale eyes and long, silky hair. The high uga. They're not too bad. They're arrogant, Naruto whispered. He had to do so lower than usual. The girl wasn't that far away from him. This one doesn't seem so, the fox responded. I can feel it. She's kind. Naruto wasn't sure how the fox sensed emotion of all things, but he did. He decided not to question it. I'll consider it, Naruto whispered. The fox nodded his head. The next person to burst through the door was a sight for sore eyes. Naruto. You fox-smelling bastard. Get over here. Naruto immediately climbed onto his desk and darted away. At back here, you mutt. Kiba and Yuzuka yelled. He chased Naruto with a smile on his face. I don't know why you associate yourself with dogs, the fox said with a yawn. They're so uncultured. He reminds me of Kaiban. Dear gods, the fox said in mock horror. There are more of them. Eventually other students filed in while Naruto was evading Kiba's good-natured chase. The fox didn't comment on them, so Naruto paid no attention to them. One of such students was a boy called Shino Aburam. Naruto made sure not to disturb him as he fled from Kiba. They had a moment of eye contact, even through the boy's shades, as he ran from the dog boy. A slight, almost imperceptible nod came from the boy. Naruto nodded back. That was all there was to say about that. Eventually, however, the academy doors burst open one last time, and two girls came barreling in at each other's necks. They seemed to be fighting over something. They were not as strong as either Naruto or Kiba. Hey. The girls yelled. They were on the ground now. Naruto had managed to dodge around them, but Kiba decided to barrel right through them. Watch where you're going. Kiba turned around with a scowl. I was, he said. If you can't take the heat, maybe you should be the ones to get out of the way. One of the two girls, a green-eyed one with pink hair, shot to her feet and advanced on Kiba. She looked confrontational, so Naruto was prepared to step in. Kiba wasn't really a friend, but he was fun to mess with. He approached the girl from behind the dog boy and was ready to fight and, stop, boy. Do you think she could survive an interaction with you? Naruto decided that he didn't care. I said, stop. There is no need. Once again right, the fox snickered as the other girl, a platinum blonde, laid her hand on the pink-haired girl's shoulder. Don't waste your energy on these two idiots. They were probably raised with no sense in their heads. Naruto wasn't raised by anyone at all, so he didn't particularly care what the girl said. Kiba, however, snarled. He growled just like Kaiban did. 
You take that back, you damn Yamanaka. The blase answer for a blase ninja, the platinum blonde girl responded. I shouldn't expect much more from an Inuzuka. Naruto could hear Kiba's growls escalate, and if he knew anything about an Inuzuka, then that meant that Kiba was preparing to go into a frenzy. Naruto didn't particularly care about the dog boy or the Yamanaka, but not doing anything about this was probably going to cause a headache later on. Walking forward, Naruto did the same to Kiba that the Yamanaka did to her hot-headed friend. He placed a hand on Kiba's shoulder. For some reason Kiba stiffened, then calmed down. Naruto, what? The Inuzuka asked. What do you want? Naruto shook his head. Calm down. Ooh, brat. The fox cut in excitedly. Only Naruto could hear it. Say this. Naruto, unsure as to why, repeated what the fox said. They're not worth your time. Their heads are all messed up from messing with other people's heads. Now that. That elicited a reaction. Why, you the Yamanaka snarled. She stalked forward, only to be held back by her pink-haired friend in a weird role reversal. Hiba, on the other hand, was delighted. You know what, bro? You're absolutely right. You know that my aunt says that all the time. Kiba then put his arm around the boy. I knew the cousin Kaiban was right about you. I could just tell you would be a good friend. So Kaiban really did send his cousin to look after him. That was nice, Naruto guessed. The Yamanaka, after visibly forcing herself to calm down, pushed her pink-haired friend off of her. Whatever, she grunted. Subpar boys like you can have each other. I'm going to hang out with someone cool. She then stalked off, her pink-haired friend in tow. They claimed seats on either side of the Achiha, much to said boy's annoyance. Hiba, instead, dragged Naruto back to his seat in the back of the class. Naruto, not one to be confrontational, simply nodded. He looked down to the suffering Achiha however. The boy seemed to be distressed. He was trying his best to ignore the two girls squealing in his ears, but to apparently no avail. Kid, no. I know what you're thinking. I can't leave him alone, Naruto said. Kiba, with his impressive hearing, heard the boy. He followed Naruto's gaze. The kid? Why not? He's a stuck-up Achiha. The insufferable dog is right. The fox howled. He's a useless, stupid, annoying, manipulative, Achiha. Naruto shrugged off their concerns, as well as Kiba's arm, and made his way down to where the girls were squabbling. The Yamanaka immediately glared at him. Naruto ignored it. Now, Naruto didn't particularly care about anyone. Besides Tenten, who graduated last year, and the Raymond shop people, there wasn't anyone in his life anymore that could garner his attention. That didn't mean that the boy didn't feel sympathy, though. He knew about what happened to the Achiha boy's entire family. He knew that the boy was an orphan like himself. He knew that the boy just wanted to be left alone sometimes. From the way that Sasuke looked at him, Sasuke knew that Naruto knew that pain as well. With pleading eyes the Achiha begged for an escape, of any kind, from the rabid fangirls around him. And so Naruto obliged. Sasuke wished that he hand. The Ichiha's charcoal black eyes widened as he felt the Uzumaki's lips crash into his own. To say it was a kiss would be a gross exaggeration. This was the blonde boy attacking his lips with his own. It was terrible on every account. And yet the two girls were shocked into silence. Their shock allowed Naruto to drag the Ichiha away from his seat and to where Kiba and he were sitting in the back of the room. And that's how Sasuke Ichiha ended up sitting in the back of the room with the delinquent boys. Even as the entire room watched in shock along with Sasuke, Kiba would not stop laughing. Naruto just kept his head down and went back to sleep. You know, kid, the fox started. 98, 99, I wasn't serious when I said that we'd start off with 100 push-ups, sit-ups, and kilometers to run. I figured that we'd go slow. Start at maybe 10. Work our way up to 100 every day. 100, Naruto chanted. Pushing up from his 100th push-up, Naruto started to limber up for his run. You can stop this. You didn't have to do it literally every day. Naruto took off for a run. Fucking humans. Why is the bastard still sitting back here with us? Kiba asked. He sat in the third seat in the row, the one next to the aisle. Sasuke was sitting in the seat in the middle and currently trying to get Naruto to switch with for the window seat. He wasn't making any progress. For once, I agree with the dog, Ino grunted. She sat in the row directly in front of them, looking exactly as disgruntled as she sounded. For once, the Kaiubi growled. I agree with the humans. Why is the bastard still sitting back here with us? Naruto, who was trying his best to ignore everyone around him, finally lifted his head from the desk. Sasuke took this moment to pounce on him. Finally, you're up. Let's switch seats. Naruto stared at the boy. A full minute passed without the boy either saying anything or blinking. Most were unnerved. Sasuke was not. I am an Ichiha. We invented that look. So you can either pay me back for that kiss you stole, or we can have an impassive stare off. Naruto didn't respond. He just kept staring. Sasuke, used to such things, impassively stared back. No one interrupted them. Not even Aruka. They continued for the whole day. Brat, Kaiubi groaned. 
that's a rock. Naruto nodded. Up, down. No, better yet, that's a boulder. You realize you're lifting a boulder. Naruto nodded again. Up, down. Brat, that's not even part of your training routine. Why are you lifting a boulder? Naruto nodded. It didn't answer the Nine Tails question. The fox pretended that it did. At least find a bigger one. Naruto nodded. He threw the boulder off him and jumped up in search of a bigger one. The rock went up, up, up. When it finally came back down it created a crater. Seriously, Kiba grunted. It was physical fitness day and Aruka was forcing them through some vigorous drills. They were currently on sit-ups. It wasn't Kiba's strong suit. Why is the bastard still hanging with us? Naruto didn't answer. He was belting through sit-up several times faster than everyone else. In truth, he was done a while ago, but Aruka couldn't find it in himself to stop the boy. I find it Ino said around gasps of breath. She was still on the push-up portion of the exercise and didn't seem to be finishing anytime soon. Disturbing that we agree so often, in Yuzuka. Sakura was even further behind than Ino. She was still on her stretches. Haruka wondered how that was possible. Sasuke, who was desperately trying to keep up with Naruto, was panting as well. The blonde bastard needs to pay me back. Sasuke then collapsed back onto the ground. He wasn't near completing even half of what Naruto had. Until he does he's going to ward off the fangirls. Well, you are going to ward off fangirls, mutt. You keep hanging out with him, though, so he's paying me back through you. Diba bristled and glared at Sasuke at the end of every sit-up. Then how is he going to pay me back for hanging out with you? Through me, Ino panted. She switched over to sit-ups, but then considered the effort and decided to take a break. The instant he stops hanging out with you and Sasuke, I'm taking that third spot. I thought you hated me, Kiba asked. I do, Ino responded, but Sasuke's coolness outweighs how much you suck. The three ninja fell into a silence. They were in awe of the rock-paper-scissors dynamic that they had somehow naturally fallen into. The silence was broken only by Naruto's now jackhammer speed as he started his squats and Shikamaru's snoring as he slept just out of view of the teachers. He was behind even Sakura. Naruto had completed his 37th run around the Hidden Leaf Village. It was 5 in the morning. Not a bad start to the day. Yosh. A youthful voice called out behind him. Naruto ignored it. Your youthful spirit is invigorating, young Naruto. The green beast of the hidden leaf ran up to Naruto and lifted him in the air. The man was wearing an all-green jumpsuit that hugged every perfectly sculpted muscle in his body. Naruto thought he looked cool. The nine tails gagged. I did not invest so much time and effort into you just for you to disappoint me like this. You are not wearing that monstrosity. Naruto considered asking for a leotard. Damn it boy, you are not wearing that. Naruto snickered. Insufferable human. I have seen you bearing your youth around the outskirts of the village and I am impressed, young Naruto. The green beat, my guy, yelled. Naruto wasn't entirely sure why, but that sentence seemed dirty. If I cannot match your youth, then I will do a thousand push-ups with boulders attached to my legs. Naruto gasped. That actually didn't sound like too bad of an idea. Human, no. Sasuke smirked. It was a wicked smile, born of literally months of trying to prove himself. Finally. Finally, I have something that I can beat you in. In the Ichiha's hand was a throwing knife. The boy tossed it in the air, letting it flip blade over handle, before catching it and doing it again. Naruto shrugged. He picked up the dull throwing knife that was placed before him and looked at the target dummy. It was a crude straw man with a target over its torso. With a shrug, Naruto flicked his wrist. His knife fell short halfway to the dummy. Sasuke's smirk widened. Ha. You throw it like this. Sasuke then flicked his wrist much harder. The knife flew straight and true before embedding itself dead center of the target. Sasuke turned, wide-eyed and victorious, to his blonde rival. See. Impressed. Naruto shrugged. After months of hanging out with the boy, Sasuke translated the action as a resounding yes. Sasuke was understandably ecstatic. Iruka, however, was not. Naruto, I know that you have never been particularly good at aiming, but you need to at least put a little bit of effort into this. Iruka then walked up to Naruto. He put a hand on the boy's shoulder. From your physical reports alone, I know that you at least make it to the dummy. Can you do that for me, Naruto? I believe that you can. Naruto looked at Aruka. His gaze, impassive and long, showed nothing of what the boy was thinking. Regardless, he took the knife that his teacher was handing him and inspected it. It was dull, just like every other knife they had. Slowly, Naruto stepped up to the starting line. Boy, the fox grumbled. Think very carefully about what you're about to do. Naruto shrugged. How bad could it be? Taking aim, Naruto tried his second chance at throwing the knife. He put minimal effort into it and the knife flew on a straight path. It missed the target completely, instead hitting the edge of the dummy's head. Sasuke laughed. Is that the bee? The knife had kept going. It pierced the stone wall behind the dummy that circled the school. 
the wall was obliterated as the knife just kept going, eventually going on to pierce through the tree surrounding the schoolyard and then leaving line of sight. The students in attendance gaped. What? We gotta go the fox yelped. I gotta go, Naruto yelled. Actually putting effort into his stride, the boy disappeared from the schoolyard. The ground where he was standing was cracked. Naruto kicked his legs. They dangled over the edge of the branch he was currently sitting on. He looked downwards, towards the ground, as he contemplated things. I told you to be careful, the fox said. Naruto nodded. M.M. For a while, silence reigned. Naruto swung his feet and the leaves were blown on the wind. You have gotten stronger. Much, much stronger than you used to be. You know that? The fox asked. Naruto once more nodded. M.M.M. So, the fox started. He hesitated on his words. You know what happened today, right? Naruto nodded. You are strong, Naruto. Far stronger than you were. M.M.M. And you're stronger than they are, too. Well, most of them, anyway. Naruto nodded. You don't like that, do you? Naruto shook his head. I'm not apologizing. You needed to get stronger in order to handle my power. You needed to get stronger in order to handle what's coming for you. Naruto grunted. What? The fox's ears twitched, not that Naruto could tell. Hmm. What do you need that for? To get stronger. Why do you want me stronger? The fox grumbled. I told you so that you could handle my power. Or did you forget about this? The tendril of red chakra snaked out of Naruto's belly. Naruto stared at it for a bit before reaching out with his left hand and grabbing it. The tendril froze in his hands as if cowed and Naruto squeezed it tight. I am strong, Naruto said. His voice was low, like he wasn't used to using it. I was strong a year ago. Still you want stronger. Why? The fox was quiet for a moment. He waited a moment longer before answering. Because you need to be. There are things out there that are stronger than you could possibly imagine. You need my power if you want to handle it. I have your po. You need more of it. Lots more of it. If you want to use it properly, then you need to be a lot stronger than you are now. Do you understand? Naruto nodded. Good. Now, next on the Lee. What? Pardon? What is it that you want me to handle? MMM, the fox mused. That is a question for another time. No, Naruto said. There was force behind it. No other time. Now. I didn't ask questions for two years. I just want the answer now. The fox was quiet once more. Several minutes passed while the two sat in the same tree that Naruto had under those two years ago. Seeing nothing else to do, Naruto started kicking his legs once more. Rat. Hmm. To the ground, for me. Naruto nodded. He jumped down to the ground and made his way over to the soft dirt. The tendril in his hand burst out and started drawing in the dirt. Do you remember your history class, brat? Naruto shook his head. The fox snorted. Well, remember this one. Tell me. In the dirt the tendril had drawn a wide circle. Inside of it were two more concentric circles centered by a dot. What do you know of a Madara Cha? School was not a normal day for Naruto anymore. It won't be that bad, the fox grumbled. Just walk in, sit down, and ignore everyone like you usually do. Piece of cake. Naruto nodded. He would ignore everyone and maybe the problem at hand, namely his performance yesterday, and maybe everything would go back to normal. With renewed confidence the blonde boy opened the door to his classroom. He took one step in. Foxy, where have you been? Uzumaki. You have returned. Naruto. What was that yesterday? Nope. You didn't tell me that you could do that. I still hit the target though. Don't forget that. At the front of the class the Hokage, who was talking to Aruka, turned around and raised an eyebrow. Naruto promptly took that step back outside and closed the door. Okay kid, I was wrong. Not a piece of cake. If we start running now we can probably get away. Naruto nodded. With a burst of strength the boy was already zooming away. Unknown to him the Hokage a man unrivaled even amongst his peers had thought of that. The aged leader snapped his fingers and another burst of strength echoed from the schoolyard. Naruto was familiar with this level of youth. Young Naruto. If I cannot catch up to you and subdue you then I will do 500 laps around Konoha on my. Naruto ignored the rest of it in favor of focusing on running. He didn't think that might guy could catch him going at top speed, but then again the green beast of the hidden leaf had a habit of breaking expectations. The man had finished the rest of Naruto's laps around the village with him, after all. Hitting the ground with as little force as possible, the fox boy blurred away. The local area had a small earthquake. Might guy, seeing it as a challenge, followed suit. The local area decided that maybe living in a ninja village wasn't so novel. It turns out that, yes, Might Guy could catch him going at top speed. You need to up your training. Naruto shook his head. No amount of training would remedy whatever hellish regimen that crazy man undertook. Naruto, the third Hokage said. The man, old by anyone's standards, gave off a genial fatherly feel. All of the younger generation of ninja, and even some civilians, couldn't help but feel at ease when talking to the senior ninja. All of the older ninjas knew that he was a senior ninja for a reason. 
you didn't survive until you had wrinkles in this profession unless you were doing something horrifically right. Hiruzen Saratobi was good at what he did. Terrifyingly good. So good that when the village was left letterless after the death of the fourth Hokage, the best candidate to take over was the wrinkly old man trying to eat his pudding in the senior home. No, older ninjas knew of the power resting just underneath the Hokage's robes and rightfully feared it. It was an enormous primal power that anyone worth their salt could feel instinctively. Without saying a word the Hokage could intimidate anyone worth intimidating. Naruto sat in front of such an existence feeling simply disgruntled. Did you have fun today? The old man asked. Naruto shook his head. He would have gotten up and left, but he was tied to a chair. With chains. I see that you had a run around the village, the Hokage continued. Was it refreshing? It was, actually, so Naruto nodded. I'm glad you feel good. The Hokage turned his head. How do you feel guy? My guy was panting on the floor in the corner of the Hokage's office. After opening six gates to catch up with the blonde, guy had to open a seventh in order to restrain him long enough to tie to a chair. He then had to find another chair because the act of restraining Naruto to a chair broke that chair. I? The Hokage asked. The green beast of the hidden leaf raised a hand, seemingly about to say something. Then he collapsed. Unfazed, the third Hokage turned back to his ward. I don't think he enjoyed the run as much. Naruto shook his head. He used a lot of energy to catch up to you. Did he? Naruto stretched what he could while being chained to a chair and felt relatively fine. He wasn't even out of breath anymore. Would you mind explaining to me why one of the best ninjas in my employ had to pull out virtually every stop in order to catch you? Naruto shrugged. I figured as much. The Hokage then rubbed his temple. With a sigh that belied the weariness of ages long outstripping anything Naruto could comprehend, the Hokage took off his hat. Now, this was a sobering experience for the young boy. Very rarely was the third Hokage seen without his hat. The red and white triangular adornment was never seen off the man's head outside of funerals, and the red and white robes of state were basically a part of him. Whatever the reason that the Hokage needed to take off his hat, it was important. Naruto, the old man asked. His eyes drooped, and with it his voice. I know that it has been a while since we last talked. Naruto couldn't remember the last time that they had talked. But you should know that you can come to me for anything. If there are any new developments or any voices talking to you, you should know that you can trust me. The fox snorted. His voice echoed in Naruto's head like a giant's in a cavern. You can trust the old man like you can trust me. Taking the fox's words to heart, Naruto rapidly shook his head. The third Hokage nodded. I see that you don't want to tell me, the Hokage then stood. But if you do feel like telling me about your life, know that my door is always open to you. Naruto nodded. A quick flex of his arms and the chains binding him snapped like cheap twine. The Hokage's eyes widened for a second before schooling back into the neutral mask that the old man was known for. Naruto stood and moved to leave. Naruto, the Hokage said. His voice was low and soft. Please, remember what I said. Naruto nodded as he left. Takashi, you will keep an eye on the boy. Yes. Pages of a book snapped together. A lazy eye rose to meet the aged leader. Of course, Lord Hokage. Naruto held his pen loosely. The test in front of him made absolutely no sense to him. I told you to pay attention in class. Naruto ignored the fox in his head. Instead, he tried to recall the many things that he zoned out while in Aruka's class over the past year. He failed, the words looked foreign on the page, even though he could read them perfectly. The fox eyed, the action akin to a rushing gale. The answer to the first question is Caton. The traditional name for fire techniques is Caton. Naruto, not having any other answer, wrote down what the fox told him. The second answer is Suetan. That's the traditional name for water techniques. The written test passed in such a way. Aruka stepped back after handing Naruto the throwing knife. The rest of the graduating class, excluding Sasuke, did the same. Tried to hit the target this time, idiot, Sasuke said, a wary smirk on his face. Naruto stared at the boy, his face betraying nothing, before readying the knife to be thrown. Fuck it, the fox growled. You're already being watched. There isn't much more to hide. Naruto nodded. He cocked his arm back. His blue eyes never left Sasuke's onyx once. Wait, idiot. You need to look at the target to aim at. Naruto's arm whipped out, the very action creating a shockwave. The knife left his hands at near supersonic speeds. To be fair, Naruto's knife missed the target, even the dummy, completely. To his credit, however, the force of the impact destroyed everything even remotely in the path of the knife. It was a good thing Naruto was chosen to be the last one tested. There wasn't much left of that half of the courtyard. Naruto, Iruka said, his voice shaky. You have technically passed every other test. But Tsuki, Iruka's assistant teacher, nodded dumbly beside the man. He spared a glance outside. The destruction from the knife throw continued over the horizon. You don't technically need to complete this part, as you've shown exemplary performance in all other activities. 
but Suki looked out the window to the rest of the students currently undergoing the Tejutsu tests. The silver-haired man looked back to Aruka, and they shared eye contact for but a second before nodding. Naruto would not be taking part in those. They had to have living students to constitute a graduating class. All we need you to do is perform the standard three basic techniques in order to let you go. Or you could not, Mitsuki piped up. You could just go. I could pass you right now and you don't have to do anything else. Iruka, who was usually a stickler for rules, almost contradicted his assistant. Then he remembered the pulverized courtyard. The boy had missed. Iruka didn't want to see what would happen if he somehow missed the clone technique and blew up the class. Or you could just pass right now, Iruka concurred. Just come take your headband. In Naruto's head the fox barked out a laugh. It's like they think you could do damage with such non-lethal techniques. Listen kid, I know that we didn't practice those, but they're laughably easy. Just do whatever and let's get out of here. Naruto nodded. An intangible clone, a transformation and switching with an object. Easy enough. It's not like he could cause damage with any of those. As Naruto prepared his hands into a hand seal, both teachers immediately ducked under their desks. The third Hokage had once more removed his hat and was now massaging his temple. Naruto, the old man said. He dragged out the name before sighing. It was really too long of a day. Naruto, who was once more tied down with chains, nodded. How did you manage to blow up the academy while doing the basic three techniques? Naruto shrugged. The third Hokage sighed. He reached into his desk and pulled out a headband. The cloth was a navy blue, with a metal plate with a hidden leaf's insignia etched into it. Just take it. And whatever you did just now don't do it again. Naruto nodded. He would only do it on enemies. Dismissed. Of course, there weren't many people who wanted to be on Naruto's team when team selection came around. Out of a grand total of 30 students, there were about four of them who wanted to be on his team. If you keep hanging out with dogs, you're going to get fleas, the fox grumbled. Naruto ignored his grumpy inner voice about his heart as he tried to ignore Kiba hanging off his shoulders. We're gonna be teammates, aren't we, Naruto? The dog boy barked. In his furry hoodie a little white puppy barked along. Naruto rubbed behind the ears of Kiba's familiar. His name was Akamaru, and he was perhaps the only one that Naruto had no problems with. DCH, came a rather snooty voice from the other side of Naruto. Sitting in the window seat was Sasuke Chiha, and he looked at Kiba like the boy was a disillusioned three-year-old. Naruto is strong. He's going to be on a strong team, with me. Naruto was tempted to agree, if only just because you are not going on the same team as in Achiha. I refuse. It wasn't up to Naruto whose team he was on, but he nodded anyway. The fox was vehement about this. Well, if Sasuke is on your team, I guess that means that I need to be as well, Ino said from the row in front of the three boys. Both Kiba and Sasuke flinched at the thought. I like her, the fox said. She would be a good mate. Naruto hoped the fox meant teammate. There's no way that you're going to be on my team, Kiba growled. I don't appreciate smartasses. Ino smirked. That doesn't surprise me. You like the dumb ones, don't you Kiba? I bet you have so much in common with them. Kiba growled, but it wasn't as hostile as it used to be. Talk all you want, Ino. I beat you in every spar. Ino rolled her eyes. Well, of course you do. It would take a beast to beat someone like you. Naruto didn't have the heart to point out that most people didn't even try to spar with him anymore. Sasuke, however, didn't have such a problem. I've beaten him, Yamanaka. Am I a beast, too? Ino looked at Sasuke, then raised a perfectly manicured blonde eyebrow. Of course you are. She then pointed to the three boys one at a time. You're all beasts. But I suppose that's charming in its own way. Ino then sniffed the air. Doesn't do much for your sweaty body odor. Sasuke smirked, and surprisingly, so did Kiba. You've become interesting these past few months, Yamanaka. Sasuke said. If you weren't so weak, I'd let you be my friend. I'm your friend whether you like it or not, Ino responded, a similar smirk on her face. Kiba scoffed. Stop flirting in front of me. You're making Naruto and I uncomfortable. Naruto doesn't mind, do you Naruto? Ino asked. Naruto looked at her. Unblinking, his stare pierced right through to her soul, chilling her to her core. Ino looked back to Kiba. See? He doesn't mind. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were jealous. Does the little Inuzuka want to date his little Yamanaka friend? Kiba, rather than take the bait, simply smirked. I'm going to miss you two bastards. Come see Naruto and me when we're put on the same team. I'm sure we'll have fun beating you silly. Sasuke actually smiled a real, genuine smile, and continued looking out the window. Yeah yeah, Naruto and I will visit your team eventually. We'll even let you try to catch up if you're too far behind us. Ino, noticing that Aruka was done setting up, turned back to the front. I'm not sure why you two think you'll be alone on Naruto's team. I'm getting him and one of you. At this point, I don't care which one it is. I just feel bad for the one left off. And like that, the class went silent as their head teacher, Aruka, read off the teams. 
Sakura, who was sitting next to her best friend, just rolled her eyes. Those four were interesting, but she was glad to be away from their insanity. Theme 1, Haruka started. Nina Hiramazaki. Hey, Naruto, Kiba whispered. Naruto turned his stare to the dog boy. This is for you. I was told to pass it to you. Naruto nodded. When he took the paper, he quickly unrolled it to reveal a single sentence written in almost neurotically clean handwriting. I hope I'm on your team. Well, that couldn't be anyone else. Naruto leaned forward to look at the class's Hayuga. The normally shy girl waved at him. He waved back. Her. I really like her. Naruto nodded. Well, with so many prospective classmates, there was little chance that he would be on absolutely none of their teams. He was on absolutely none of their teams. How? Ino screamed, her hands pounding the table in protest. How is he not on anyone's team? We had exactly the amount of people needed to fill a roster of three-man teams. How is Naruto not on any of ours? Aruka, feeling sheepish, had the decency to meet his students' eyes. We had an emergency addition to our class over the past couple of weeks. He had to fill the roster as well, and it was decided that he would fit a team better than Naruto would. Kiba looked to be on the verge of breaking. His sharp nails gouged lines into the wooden desk, and his teeth ground into each other so hard that others could hear it. There was a low growl emanating from either him or his equally upset puppy, and Naruto couldn't tell which. Naruto has been with us for the whole year. He has better chemistry with us than any new kid possibly could. When did we even get a new kid? Aruka directed his attention away from the dog boy to a different corner of the room. Sure enough, in the third seat in the row with Choji and Shikamaru sat another boy. His skin was pale, almost impossibly so, to the point that it was almost as white as snow. Hello, the boy said. He raised his hand and waved it. He attempted to smile, but the action was at best a cheap imitation of a smile. I am Sai. It is nice to meet you. Kiba stared at the boy, his mouth agape and his eyes unfocused. He tried to take in the boy but failed, having gained absolutely no impression whatsoever. Instead, Kiba turned back to the teacher. He raised an arm and gestured at the boy. That. You want that to be on a team over Naruto. You think that we can form any cohesion with an emotionless husk of a child like that. To his credit, Sai didn't react to the insult. Instead, the boy smiled again. The action creeped several of the onlooking students. Haruka just tilted his head. You got along with Naruto? The man asked. Like biscuits and gravy, Kiba responded. Then this should be much of the same. Coincidentally Naruto took this time to acknowledge Sai. The pale boy met Naruto's gaze, and the two stared at each other. Neither blinked for a whole minute before, somehow, they both came to some sort of unspoken agreement and turned away. The class shared a collective shudder. Kiba sat down. His eyes were still fierce as he laid his head down, burying his face in his arms as he did so. This isn't over, yet. He grumbled. Now, is everyone done? Haruka asked. No one responded. Great. Everyone you will be staying here waiting for your sensei. Naruto. You will be coming with me. Seeing no reason to resist, the boy stood up and walked towards his teacher. Haruka nodded, then opened the classroom door. Sparing one glance over his shoulder, the blonde boy blinked before closing his door on his almost friends. Naruto, the third Hokage said. He had his hand steepled before him as he looked over the boy he was quickly becoming wary of. I'm sure that you are wondering why you are here today. Naruto shrugged. He didn't particularly care why he was here. Not being chained down before the old man was a nice change to the usual routine, though, so Naruto obliged the man. I'm sure that you're confused as to why you weren't placed on a team. The Hokage shouldered through the boy's silence. The third was long used to Naruto's lack of speech. The answer is a bit unorthodox. Even we weren't prepared for the decision. Naruto nodded, showing that he was listening. The Hokage took a deep breath before answering. When he did, his eyes were softer, but no less guilty. You are too strong. I could have told you as much, the fox grumbled. You were able to outpace and even overpower one of my physically strongest ninja. Are you ready to tell me how this came to be? Naruto shook his head. I figured as much, the Hokage sighed. He then reached over and retrieved a small manila file. He thumbed through a few pages before landing on a page and pulling it out. The Hokage made to examine it for a bit before turning it to Naruto. The page had a picture on it of a destroyed landscape. Have you ever seen this before, Naruto? Naruto looked at the picture and affirmed that he had in fact not seen that place before in his life. Of course not. The Hokage replaced the picture in the folder and sat back in his chair. That is the crater where your most recent attempt at tossing kunai ended. Somewhere, far under the ground, your kunai has most likely shattered on the bedrock. Before this picture was a crater, however, the Hokage leaned forward, his face grim, that was a rather bustling hub for the local wildlife. It was well forested and densely populated. Now it is a crater. The Hokage then reached to remove his hat. As he placed the hat on his oaken desk, he sighed once more. 
that is a crater that is several miles away from where you threw that knife, with a trail of destruction and disarray leading up to it. Do you have an explanation for that, Naruto? You throw very hard, the fox applied. I throw very hard, Naruto parroted. The Hokage obviously wasn't accepting that as an answer. Is that all? Did you use a special technique? Any chakra? The Hokage then paused and then said his next words very carefully. Do you use any special chakra? No, Naruto answered, his voice soft. I used my muscles. No one can throw that hard with just their muscles, the Hokage responded. His wrinkled face seemed to crease even more as he tried to explain what seemed like perfect knowledge to a yet not understanding boy. Naruto tilted his head, apparently lost. The Hokage rubbed his temple. We're putting you on a team by yourself. At Naruto's even more confused face, the old man continued. You are obviously much more powerful than you should be, so we can't place you on any team without upsetting the scales. Instead, we're making it so that you're on a need to have basis. Effective immediately you're essentially a freelance ninja. Naruto nodded. The Hokage knew that he hadn't understood. You're a ninja, okay. The old man recited. But think of it as more of a hobby. You're a hero for hobby, okay. You know, the old landlady chirped. You really don't belong here. Naruto, for the third time that day, shrugged. His landlady had said that to him numerous times throughout the day and would not stop repeating it until he responded. Instead of dignifying a conversation, the boy shrugged and got back to doing his job for the day. Cleaning the gutters of his own apartment building. I don't mean here, the lady said, gesturing to the apartment building. I mean here, as in doing this. You're far too skilled. You're more than overqualified. Once again Naruto shrugged. Using a new technique his jonin teacher of the week taught him, Naruto coated his hand with chakra. A thin film of the stuff coated his hand, and Naruto attempted to use the now gloved appendage to sweep the gunk out of the gutters. As soon as he tried, however, he lost focus. The light coating of spiritual and physical energy dissipated from his hand, leaving him to touch the mud and leaves with his bare skin. You, Naruto said. His face scrunched up as the landlady smiled. I knew you could talk, she said, her mirth evident from the chuckle that escaped her lips. You should do it more often. You're far too young to have run out of words. Naruto considered shrugging once more but thought better of it. Instead he wiped the gunk off his hand and onto his pants. He leaned back from his perch on the wall and stared at his neighbor. No. The old lady chuckled. And why not? Because, Naruto said, his voice soft and barely audible. Only years of listening for the slightest noise allowed the retired ninja to hear the boy. I don't want to. Ah, the landlady said, an air of knowing in her voice. Then what do you want to do? Naruto seemed to take a moment. The chakra, which he had tried to reapply, dissipated from his hand once more as the boy seemingly stared off into the distance. After a while the boy seemed to snap out of his reverie with a shake of his head. He leaned back from the wall again and stared at his landlady. I want to get stronger. The landlady lost her smirk almost immediately. With a hum, the old ninja hobbled back into her house and retrieved a white envelope. With a huff, she tossed it out into the open air and watched as the boy detached himself from the building wall to chase after it. With all the grace of a brick, the boy shot through the air and caught the envelope before falling to the ground and landing unharmed. There's the payment for the D-ranked mission, brat. The landlady leaned on her windowsill as she stared imperiously down at the orange-wearing boy. It'll get split when you report in, but I ask that you get a good cut. I know the old monkey. He'll give you some spending money. Naruto, instead of thanking her, simply looked back to the gutters. The landlady huffed. Don't worry about that. I sent in the mission as an excuse to talk to you anyway. If I wanted the gutters cleaned, they'd be clean. Naruto raised a perfectly blonde eyebrow in response. The landlady rolled her eyes. She ran through hand seals faster than Naruto could discern. Earth technique. Cleaning out the gutters. Immediately all of the gunk in the gutters jumped out and floated as if possessed. Naruto would have whistled at the feet if not for the mischievous grin on the old lady's face. At going, boy, the landlady grunted. As if those words were the command, the gunk seemed to tense before flying at the blonde boy. Naruto dodged the first volley easily enough, but the next came at increasing speed. Before long, Naruto had to flee, the gunk following him as if on a mission. The landlady looked after the boy wistfully. Once he was effectively out of her sight, the old lady turned and hobbled back into her room. So you're looking to get stronger, brat. The landlady rubbed at her bad leg, a habit that was almost instinctual at this point. Don't we all? Naruto stepped into the room of the Hokage, his bright blue eyes taking in everything around him. The Hokage, as usual, sat rather leisurely behind his desk, but prior knowledge clued Naruto into the fact that the man was anything but relaxed. Ah, the old man said. He looked up from a piece of paper he was examining to eye the young blonde as he made his way into the room. I see you are done with the mission. Were you given your pay? Naruto nodded before walking forward and placing the envelope on the desk. 
The third Hokage opened it and leafed through its contents, before landing on a note that was included alongside the pay. The Hokage read it quickly, allowing first a scowl, then a small smile to grace his face. Your client is rather manipulative. She intends to have me give you the full pay. Naruto nodded. It made sense. He did, after all, do the full work. Sort of. Mostly. However, that is not how it works. If the village is to have any capital, we need to tax our people for their services. It is customary for us to take a majority percentage of the pay, but since this is a low-ranked mission and I know the client, the Hokage continued to take a small pile of coins off the top of the payment. I think I can excuse it this one time. Take your payment and be gone, Jen and Yuzumaki. Naruto nodded, then walked forward and took the money left for him on the desk. He made to count it, but then suddenly decided that such a thing wasn't necessary. Instead, the boy shoved the money into his pocket and made for the door. As his hand reached for the handle, however, the door was shoved open. Unfortunately for whoever was on the other side, Naruto stood barring the entry to the room. The door stopped immediately upon hitting Naruto, even at knowing an unstoppable force when meeting it. Naruto stood unperturbed by the occurrence, even though whoever it was on the other side very clearly collapsed from the unexpected run-in with a suddenly immovable door. The blonde looked around, uncertain of what he had to do, and eventually let his eyes fall on his leader. The Hokage sighed. Dust let whoever that is in. Naruto nodded and stepped to the side. The door, warily this time, opened and allowed in a rather disheveled chunin. What the hell was that the boy, just barely into his teens, mumbled. He shook off his disorientation soon enough and looked to his leader. Never mind that. Lord Hokage. There is grave news from Team Kakashi. The Hokage snorted. Don't you mean Team 7? He insisted that I call it otherwise sir. Very well, the Hokage allowed, knowing that while Kakashi was childish, the man was also stubborn and easily one of the best soldiers at his command. He would allow such frivolity. What is this grave news? It appears that Jonin Kakashi and his pack of genin have run into enemy missing ninja while on their trip. He is requesting backup. The Hokage sighed, then rubbed the bridge of his nose. Why didn't he abandon the mission and return, should that have been the case? The Chuanin looked away, then started rubbing the back of his neck. He, uh, included that in his SOS. He said that, and I quote, his cute little genin were too hard to refuse. The Hokage sighed. Of course he did. Very well, I will endeavor to send him some reinforcements. And the Hokage then proceeded to do so, before he realized something. He didn't have to call for anyone if the strongest and cheapest paid member of his forces was in this very room. Genin Yuzumaki, the third called. Like a good soldier, Naruto answered, albeit clumsily. His salute was a little lax. The Hokage didn't mind. You are to travel to the land of waves and assist Jonin Haddock and his squad in whatever little trouble they find themselves in. As per usual, you are freelance, but for the duration of the rest of their trip, you are to answer to Kakashi Haddock. Is that understood? Naruto nodded. Then make speed, Naruto, the third said with what he hoped was fondness in his voice. He hadn't been able to connect with the boy as much as he had wanted to, but he hoped there was still some sort of connection there between himself and the boy. That hope was answered when Naruto smiled back. It was a tiny, almost imperceptible thing, but the boy smiled regardless. Of course, Gramps, the boy said, before turning and making his way out of the room. He was gone before long, leaving the Hokage alone in his office with the confused Chunin who had notified him and really far too much paperwork. The Hokage was prepared to dismiss the boy and go about his work again, when a small quake from outside the tower here is ided and interrupted that. What the the Chunin asked? The third held up a hand. That was Naruto, the elder said, his voice weary. He's on his way to wave. Oh, the Chuanin responded, clearly surprised. I guess that's it, then. The two went silent, letting the sentence and its implications sit in the air. It was the Chuanin who broke it. I'm surprised he knows the way to wave. Silence reigned once more. The Hokage put a hand to his head. Shit. Going out of the village for the first time was supposed to be a magnificent adventure. Naruto could just feel it. Where the village was boring and stagnant and filled with disapproving looks, the world outside was to be amazing. Princesses and evil warlords, power-hungry mad scientists and evil cults. All of that and more was supposed to be awaiting him the instant he stepped out of the village. What he was met with, however, was more of the same. Kidnapped princesses. A man asked while half-leaning on an old gardening tool. You realize that we're a farming village, right? We don't have any princesses here. If you want that, you're going to have to head to the fire capital. After asking and being assured that no, there weren't any missing villagers to be found, Naruto reluctantly made his way to the fire capital. Princess. Why would we allow you to see the princess? A royal guard asked Naruto. The boy, who was currently standing unperturbed even though there were three different guards trying to move him, just shrugged in response. She's fine and doesn't need saving. Now Shu. Go about your day. Naruto did just that. He went about his day and stumbled into rice country. 
Bad scientists? A bespectacled young man asked. He adjusted his glasses nervously, his eyes roaming everywhere but the honest blue eyes of the young man. None of that here. I assure you. Dorito stared at the man. His gaze pierced through to the man's very soul. I assure you on my name that Lord Orochimaru isn't here. Dorito shrugged. He had no idea who this Orochimaru was, but he didn't seem like an evil scientist. Bidding the young man a good day much to said young man's relief Naruto took off again. Surprisingly, he did find a cult. Lord Janshin demands your blood. A silver-haired man yelled. He hefted a mighty fine scythe above his head. Just a single blade of the weapon was bigger than Naruto, and each of the scythe's three blades was tinted the color of blood. Speaking of which, Naruto wasn't sure of the last time that he saw his own blood. Giving a half-hearted shrug, the boy held out his arm and prepared for the swing. At least it would be interesting. Ask for directions when you're done, the fox sighed. You've been roaming far too much. Naruto snorted. He wasn't roaming, he was just hitting up places on his way to wave. Wherever wave was. Sasu cursed, or tried to, as he ducked under yet another volley of ice needles. Scarlet eyes darted around the battlefield, trying to take in everything they could, before their owner reacted. New to the Sharingan, Sasuke was quickly realizing that he wasn't nearly fast enough to react to the things that he could see. And that was a problem. Stand still, you freak. Sasuke yelled. With practiced ease, the raven-haired boy pulled a knife out of a holster on his leg. With a twirl, he swiped upwards, deflecting several ice shards that were aimed for him. That would appear unwise, his opponent answered. The masked boy or girl as they were wearing a kimono, then slunk back into a floating mirror of ice. It was one of many that surrounded the Achiha, some of which were floating in the air, forming a dome of ice mirrors that had very little space in between. You will prove interference to my precious person, and for that reason, I cannot allow you to escape. The masked ninja, now reflected in every mirror, seemed to hesitate before continuing. I don't I don't want to hurt you, the masked person said. Even through the mask, Sasu could feel the reluctance in his opponent. But if you push the issue, I will kill my heart in order to do what I must. If you just stand down, I will let you live. Sasuke scowled. His teeth grinded against each other as he contemplated the dilemma he was currently in. Simply put, he was outmatched in every way against his opponent. They were faster, stronger, and simply better than he was. He had unlocked the Sharingan after so many years of trying and still, it just wasn't enough. It was frustrating. After all this time he was no closer to Itachi than he was before. The gap between them seemed to be widening every time he thought he was shortening it. Worse still, he wasn't even getting closer to Naruto. Sasuke was under no illusions about how strong he himself was. He was the best of his generation, that's for sure, but before Itachi's progress he was behind. By this age Sasuke's murderous older brother was already a prospective Anbu. By his age Naruto, who was technically younger than him, was decimating landscapes with nary a thought. Damn it, Sasuke cursed. His empty hand twitched, and briefly he contemplated reaching for a second knife. I wouldn't recommend it, the masked ninja said, their voice echoing around the area through the multiple mirrors. You're no stronger for it. I haven't been going at full speed. You'll have twice the weapons to deflect my needles, but I'll be going at thrice the speed. Sasuke's hand stopped halfway to his holster. Now frozen there, he had no choice but to abandon that thought. Was the masked ninja telling the truth, or were they bluffing? Could they really go three times as fast as they were going now? He could barely keep up with them as he was. Reluctantly, Sasuke let his free hand fall. He had no other choice. He wanted to continue the fight, but he couldn't risk dying. It hurt, but he was outmatched. To lose here would mean his pride, and that was all he had left. But he couldn't avenge his clan if he were dead. Damn it Sasu cursed. His fist clenched around the knife in his hand. Damn it, damn it, damn it. It was so frustrating. He burned and he bled, and he freaking cried to get where he was now. He did everything he could, and still it wasn't enough. There were others out there who were simply stronger than him. Some of those people were his own age. If only if only he was stronger. If only he were faster. This masked ninja would be a piece of cake if he had been faster. Was he not training hard enough? Was that it? That had to be it. Before, his goal of revenge was enough to keep him going. But he hadn't seen Itachi in years. His rage was still burning, but it was muted now. Colder. Some far-off dream that could be accomplished whenever. No, Sasuke remembered when he trained his heart out. Sasuke remembered when he had a tangible rival egging him on from beside him. Tiba Inuzuka was crass and a bit of a jerk, but he always pushed himself to keep up with Sasuke. Whether it was out of sheer stubbornness or a desire to prove himself, Kiba was a worthy rival that Sasuke had to work to keep ahead of. Sasuke remembered when he had support of someone whose opinion mattered. Ino Yamanaka was a worthy ninja. She wasn't physically as strong as he or Kiba, but where she lacked in power, she made up in skill. And she frowned over him. Sure, she did it with a scathing tongue and condescending eyes, but that was what he needed. 
acceptance without blind adoration. Sasuke remembered the pillar that showed him what was possible. Naruto was a bastion of hope for the young Ichiha. He was power incarnate. He was silent acceptance. He was an enduring rival to pursue. They were all friends. They were all taken away from him as he was put on a team with the silent boy and the pink-haired one. Damn it, Sasu cursed again, his prized eyes closing in an attempt to stave off his frustration. Damn it all. Where are you guys when I need you, if only he had them. I can't get what I want like this. Is this as far as I go? If only he were stronger. Damn it, where are you guys? If only he were faster. Damn it, Sasu choked out. Where are you, Naruto? This was where Sasu had decided. Dying here was better than never being able to face his brother. He would die anyway with his lackluster skills, so why not go out with the one thing he had left? His pride on his sleeve, Sasuke reached for his second knife anyway, spinning all the while to attempt to keep an eye on his opponent. You fool, the masked ninja hissed. They darted from mirror to mirror, throwing ice needles while they moved at supersonic speeds. Sasuke managed to deflect some, but quite a few embedded themselves in the boy's skin before he even retrieved his second weapon. You will die here, the masked ninja hissed. Each of the reflections raised a hand, revealing a fist full of needles. Perhaps, Sasuke responded, a bloody smirk on his face. But at least I died with honor. Is that it? Is your honor worth your life? The masked ninja sounded genuinely confused. It made Sasuke smile all the harder. For me? Sasuke asked. Definitely. Pride is all a man has, after all. Sasuke then smirked even harder somehow. But at least I know you're definitely a woman, now. This seemed to bristle the masked ninja. Two needles dug into Sasuke's knees before he could even react, felling Sasuke to the ground. W what? I told you, the masked ninja said. I wasn't even going at a third of my speed. The masked ninja looked away. It was weird as the action was reflected in each mirror. Though it is regrettable, I am going to have to take you out. Please, forgive me. This time, Sasuke could see them. Needles seemed to pour out of the mirrors. Unlike before, however, where they came out one at a time at extremely fast speeds, this time they seemed to come from all around him, all at once. Sasu closed his eyes. There was no deflecting this. Kakashi grunted. He was forced back by Zabuza once more. Where Kakashi had technique and skill galore, the man in front of him was pure strength. Zabuza's sword, which was little more than an oversized cleaver, had been embedded in the stone bridge nearly halfway. Kakashi was a tall man. The sword was nearly his height. It was buried halfway into the stone bridge. Cowardice doesn't befit your name, copy ninja. Zabuza hefted the sword out of the stone with one hand. He let it rest on his shoulder. Come, fight me. Bakashi scoffed. Like that was going to happen. Deep in this mist was where the rogue ninja excelled. He wasn't fighting on even ground with Zabuza so long as he was in it. Are you not coming to me? The man asked. Very well. Then I will come to you. With that Zabuza, cloaked in all black with bandages covering his face, slowly retreated to the far end of the bridge. The mist engulfed him, and soon he was out of sight. Bakashi wasted no time. A second knife was in his hands in less than a second, and his one Sharingan darted over what limited area he could see. Heart, lungs, kidneys, Zabuza whispered from the mist. His gruff voice echoed out from just beyond sight in every direction. There are so many vital places that I could cut. How would you prefer to die today, copy ninja? Bakashi very much preferred not to die. It was with this resolve that he ducked under a horizontal slash that displaced the mist around him from sheer force alone. Their reflexes are good, Haddock, Zabuza said with a sneer. But they will dull with exhaustion. Come. Bakashi grunted as he raised both of his knives. They stopped the man's cleaver just short of hitting him, but only barely. Zabuza smiled. He had forced Kakashi to grunt from the sheer force he was pushing down. Your life will end today, just like that of your students. They don't stand a chance against Haku. He is the last of his clan and a wielder of the rare ice release. Bakashi let himself spare a glance towards the dome of ice. For a second, he let himself feel worry and the urge to rush over and help his students almost overwhelmed him. Doing so would expose his back to an enemy that they could not let roam free, however, and thus Kakashi squashed that urge. He was of no use to his team dead. He would just have to have trust in his students. Besides, he was sure at least Sakura was okay. You're not the only one with an amazing blood talent on your side, Kakashi grunted. He started to push back the cleaver, albeit slowly. I have the last of the Ichiha. Zabuza looked surprised at those words. That shock was soon gone, however, replaced by a barking laugh. Is that so? Is that good enough, though? Kakashi sincerely hoped it was. Warm liquid splashed his face. To Sasuke's surprise, however, it wasn't his own blood. Slowly, the Ichiha opened his eyes to see, not a hail of needles, but several animals of ink surrounding him. One animal, which he couldn't make out anymore, had fallen apart and bathed the circle around him in ink. Within the goo he could see stained needles melting away. 
Pretty boy, a voice called from outside the dome. Do you need assistance? Sasuke wanted desperately to reply with a sarcastic no, but that would probably be interpreted literally and he would be left alone. Instead, he nodded vigorously and hoped that the boy could actually help him. Very well, Sai replied. On cue, a myriad of ink animals climbed from the sides of the bridge. Orangutans, snakes, lions, tigers and an elephant. Yeah, an elephant, launched over the railings and headed straight for the dome. The masked ninja, rather than be alarmed, simply prepared more ice needles. They flew out of the mirror, from behind this time, and pierced the ink beasts before they reached the dome. Pretty boy, now. Sai screamed. As one the ink beasts raced for the small gaps between the ice mirrors. Haku had caught wind of this, however, and refocused his attention to the inside. The needles came slower, however, as the masked boy had to focus on the ink animals still coming from outside. Sasuke made to follow the animals in their charge when an ink gorilla grabbed him. What are you Sasuke started. He was cut off when Sai's voice started to come from the beast. You are not going with them. You are meant to go up. And then the beast, with no further prompting, cocked its arm back. Wait, Sasuke said, his voice trembling. You couldn't possibly be. The gorilla launched Sasuke, sending him flying for a gap in the ice mirrors at the top of the dome. Surprisingly there was no reflection in the ice mirror making up the dome ceiling. In his flight Sasuke could make out his pale teammate diving towards him on a bird of ink. Pretty boy. Sai called. My hand. Sasuke nodded. He held out his hand to take Sai's outstretched one. He was close, almost making it clear of the ice dome, when a sandaled foot kicked him in the chest, sending him careening back down to the bridge. He hit it with bone-crunching force, and for a second he could feel the wind knocked out of him. Darn, Sai cursed. He made to fly back to the safety of the air, but ice needles pierced his bird before he could ascend. Abandoning it, Sai intended to retreat once more. Then a water bullet shot him out of the air. He fell, twisting in midair, before clipping an ice mirror and falling into the dome. Unlike Sasuke, Sai was able to land on his feet. Much like Sasuke, however, the boy was injured to the point he could barely move. S.I., Sasuke grunted. He had managed to push himself to his hands and knees, but not much further. Can you do that again? The ink things. Sai shook his head. It took me far too long to get even that many done. Why do you think I couldn't help you before? Sai then frowned. Still, as it stands, I barely have any chakra left. We're stuck. Sasu cursed. With visible struggle he forced himself back to his feet. With another knife in his hand, he attempted to ready himself, but failed to do so. You're dead on your feet, Ichiha, the masked person said. Once more did he have a volley of ice needles holstered in his fist. I can see you swing. Give up, now. I will let you live. Maybe we should take his advice, Sai whispered. Sasu pushed the boy away. The action nearly cost him his balance, but it was worth it. No, Sasuke grunted. I will not give up now. I refuse to lose before I'm standing before that man again. The masked boy in each of the mirrors seemed to sag. It was obvious, the disappointment reflected across the many mirrors. If that is how you choose to proceed, then you cannot begrudge me on how I choose to proceed. I will kill my heart and with it, you. The masked boy, Haku, readied his projectiles. Please forgive me in the pure world. Sasuke once again closed his eyes. Sai didn't. Um, you realize that I'm not exactly with him, correct? I am fine with giving up to live another day. Whether or not Sai was heard was inconsequential. Haku released his ice needles at the both of them. The projectiles, deadly and precise and sharp, sailed straight and true for the two downed ninjas. Sasuke had accepted his death. It was really too fortunate that another didn't. Sakura heard her voice before she registered that she was screaming. It was an unconscious action, born of concern and fear for her teammates. The ice needles closed in fast around them, packed so thick that they were an almost wall of white. They would pierce and skewer then boys without fail, leaving them bloody and bruised and surely dead. Then, far off, a shockwave shook the bridge. It was a clap that threw even her off her feet. Behind her the person her team was meant to protect, a bridge builder by the name of Tazuna, cried in alarm as he held onto his bridge's railing. Then, like a divine breath of the gods, a gale swept over the bridge. It pushed away first the mist, then the hail of needles. The ice mirrors attempted to hold their form, but even they were blown away from the gale's unstoppable onslaught. The bridge, now clear of smog, showed all of its occupants. Sasuke and Sai lay on the ground further down the bridge. They were caught in the gale with nothing to hold onto, and thus were carried away. Even further down the bridge lay Haku under the debris of his own broken ice mirrors. He was very clearly knocked out. Further up the bridge Zabuza, the scary missing ninja, held onto his massively oversized cleaver. He had stabbed it into the bridge and was using it as both an anchor and a shield against the wind. It proved effective. Akashi had done the same with his two knives. What was what was that? Tazuna asked. Sakura didn't know. 
She looked to the direction where the blow came, only to see something she hadn't seen in a very long time. Standing with a fist outstretched as if he had just thrown a punch, was a blonde-haired, orange-clad boy. Said boy slowly retracted his fist and stood in a more casual stance, before tilting his head. As the boy started. Is this finally wave country? Zabuza was so close to winning. The biggest, and perhaps only, obstacle between him and his pay was on his knees before him. Kakashi Haddock, the copy ninja, could do little to escape him and his signature hidden mist. Now that the man was on the defensive and buckled under the weight of Kubakiribacho, all he had to do was win the war of attrition, and the leaf ninja's life would be forfeit. As a side, his loyal weapon had the copy ninja's brats cornered as well. Victory was all but assured for him. Soon he'd have enough to go fund his second attempt at revolution. Soon, his home village would finally be liberated and, and then a gust of wind, stronger than any technique he had ever felt before, blew through the area. It blew away his chakra augmented mist as if it were simple fog and even displaced him. Thinking quickly, the mist ninja stabbed his sword into the bridge and held on for dear life. Behind him, beyond the howling gale, Zabuza heard the ice mirrors crack and the brats yelling for dear life. Had it grunted as well, before holding true to his name and copying Zabuza by stabbing his weapon into the bridge. They were all affected, so this attack was indiscriminate. But who was so strong to attack two high-class ninjas like that? Eventually the mist completely cleared and the gust died down accordingly. After a few seconds of calm, Zabuza endeavored to look up from his sword, only to see something he wasn't expecting. It was a boy, clad in all orange and with the brightest bluest eyes he had ever seen. His blonde hair seemed to shine more intensely than the sun, which was offset by how utterly bland and bored the boy looked. His fist was outstretched, as if he had just thrown a punch, but that was impossible. There was no way anyone could punch so hard that they created a gust of wind that strong from the effort alone. And why was there a gash in the jumpsuit's arm? Elsewhere the immortal Jashin priest Haydn lay completely defeated on the ground. Or rather, his head did. The rest of his body lay splattered across the ravaged remains of what used to be a clearing. Now, however, it was a destroyed pockmark spanning several miles. Haydn's head coughed, drawing power from lungs that no longer existed. How what the fuck was that? The priest had attempted to slice into the boy. He had a quota for blood each day, damn it. That stupid little blonde boy would fulfill that quota and everything would be fine. Haydn was in such a good mood that he might have even responded to those Akatsuki jerks. Best of all, the boy seemed to even understand the importance of his most important vigil. The little blonde bastard held out his hand at Haydn's demand of blood. Haydn had smiled viciously. Perhaps he might not kill the boy after all. It was okay to leave subjects mostly dead. So he raised his three-pronged scythe and cackled as he attempted to bisect the boy's arm. Haydn was not prepared to see his scythe shatter against the boy's arm. It had cut through the boy's jumpsuit well enough, but against his arm it faltered. W what? Haydn asked, eyes wide and voice failing him. The boy, instead of being surprised, looked disappointed. He had looked to his ripped jumpsuit top and frowned. He poked and rubbed at the place where the wound should have been and seemed genuinely disappointed that there was none there. So I don't get to see my blood today. That is fine, I was busy anyway. Haydn had sputtered. He tried to talk, but the boy beat him to it. Hey, crazy guy. Do you happen to know where the land of waves is? Haydn didn't, but he had grunted and said that he would tell the boy if he could beat him. Seconds later, and Haydn was ahead lying in a divot. Damn it, Haydn cursed. It's going to be a while before I recover from this one. Akatsuki would have to wait for his reply. Zabuza shrugged, then decided that it didn't matter where the rip came from. Standing up, the hidden mist rogue pulled his sword from the ground and pointed it at the young boy standing before him. Hey, runt, Zabuza grunted. His voice was deep and gruffy and just slightly intimidating. It was a voice he used when confronting children that were swimming in waters far too deep for them. Were you the one to dispel my hidden mist technique? The boy didn't respond, instead looking at his fist. He stared at it blankly, regarding the thing as if it were the first time he had ever seen it. After staring at it for a few seconds, the blonde decided that, yes, this was in fact his own fist, and let it drop back to his side. Yes, the boy responded. He looked at Zabuza with yet another blank expression, then tilted his head as if bored. I suppose I am. Zabuza scoffed. The kid supposes, huh? Well, I won't lie, that was impressive. I'm not sure of what wind technique you used to do it, but you must be pretty skilled in the art in order to make a gust that strong. The boy tilted his head further. Wind technique? I don't know any wind techniques. Well, what do you mean? Zabuza asked. Then what do you call what you just did? Naruto shrugged. A punch. Zabuza had enough. With a heft of his sword, the rogue ninja dashed forward, his sword held in a double grip behind him. To such an inexperienced brat's eye, Zabuza knew that he was little more than a blur. As his speed carried him over to the boy, Zabuza raised his sword to decapitate the young man. 
Then, something curious happened. Zabuza was on top of the boy. His sword was prepped back and his muscles were tense to swing. In less than a second, his sword would cleave through both the air and the boy's head and he could return to eviscerating his real prey. But there is something to be said about a ninja's instincts. In the world that he lived in, Zabuza had long ago realized that attacks and threats could come from virtually anywhere. Instincts, while often irrational, have saved his life many times in his career as an official ninja and even more in his time as a rogue one. Zabuza learned to trust his instincts implicitly, to the point of almost paranoia. So when his instincts screamed at him, wailing and crying and begging him to back away from the blonde-haired boy, he did. In a move completely uncharacteristic to him, he employed every muscle in his body and every ounce of chakra that he could reasonably spare to leap backwards in a single bound. The boy seemed unaware of Zabuza's problem. He tilted his head and stared at the Miss Ninja with obvious confusion. Weren't you going to cut me? The boy asked. His voice was so lackadaisical. As if what he was asking was as common as asking for a glass of water. I am, boy. Don't you worry about that, Zabuza responded, but he was nowhere near as calm as his voice made him seem. The hairs on the back of his neck were raised and sweat dripped down his forehead as he tried to contemplate the reason that fear had settled into his bones before he had even swung. Why? Zabuza asked himself. Why does this boy frighten me so? Across from him, Zabuza noticed that the boy had no intention to move, instead seeming to be content standing where he was. For some reason, the copy ninja behind him was doing the same. Seeing this, Zabuza took some time to look over what he was doing. He had charged the boy, and for all intents and purposes, it seemed like he was in the clear. The boy would be beheaded and he'd be able to move on. Then his instincts roared at him, and he had to back off. What was going on with that? Come to think of it, it happened right before, right before the boy looked at him. It was a faint almost imperceptible thing, but the boy's sky blue eyes darted over towards his. They made eye contact, and instead of being afraid, like he was supposed to be, the boy was nonplussed. He almost seemed bored. So, you're more than you let on, Zabuza grumbled, to which the boy tilted his head more. It was concerning how horizontal his head was. I'm just me. I'm Naruto. Zabuza's eye twitched. I'm going to kill you, brat. Naruto shrugged. Zabuza responded by bringing his unburdened hand into a hand seal. Hidden miss technique. Bakashi stared at the rogue ninja, his Sharingan eye spinning as he took in the scene before him. Zabuza, the man that he himself was having so much trouble with, had retreated so violently from the boy's reaction. While it may have taken the Miss Ninja a second to realize what had happened, Kakashi and his increased perception had seen the truth immediately. Somehow Naruto had seen the man approach. Zabuza was by no means a particularly fast opponent, but he certainly wasn't a slouch. Even to him Zabuza was almost a blur as he darted across the bridge to get the jump on the blonde powerhouse. And Naruto, the little enigma, had his eyes on the man the entire time. His blue orbs tracked the man as he darted back and forth across the bridge. He seemed to not care as Zabuza blurred behind him, but then, at the last second, turned to stare at the Miss Ninja as he brought his giant cleaver down. Naruto had looked bored. As if the entire thing was beneath him. It wasn't even a false bravado, brought upon by shock, that he had seen in so many green ninjas before. This was a genuine disinterest. Naruto looked at the attack and had genuinely seen it as ultimately harmless. So he didn't move. Sure enough, Zabuza had done it for him. So Naruto was fine. Kakashi was unsure as to the power of the child, as he was rather elusive in the village, but apparently there was nothing for him to worry about. Kakashi turned and regarded his students. Naruto could take care of himself. Mist started to creep in once more from the sea around the bridge. It settled in fast, quickly blanketing the bridge in a layer of fog, before growing denser and higher. Soon, the bridge was completely covered in the stuff, and vision was all but an impossibility. Naruto looked down at his fist once more, then raised a blonde eyebrow as he regarded it once more. The fox enunciated for the contemplative boy. So your punches can produce gales of wind, huh? The fox snorted. Something like that took me many years to master. It seems that you learned to do it completely by accident. Naruto nodded. He looked back into the mist that surrounded him and prepared to punch at it again, only for something heavy to hit him and throw him off balance. The power that he was building up was dispelled, and he staggered a bit before riding himself. Naruto hadn't noticed, but there was a new gash on his jumpsuit. What was that? The fox asked. He couldn't see what was going on outside, not much, but he could tell when his host was feeling that something was off. I don't know Naruto whispered. He reared back his arm to toss another punch, only for it to be knocked off course as well. This time the energy hadn't fully dispersed however, and the aftershock of the attack pulsed into the bridge, cracking the stone. The scattered shards spread far, one such piece piercing the mist and bouncing off of something that was nearly invisible inside of it. The nearly invisible thing had a gasp of pain, and Naruto raised an eyebrow. Interesting, Naruto muttered. 
He reared back his fist once more, and when the invisible blur came in to intercept the attack, he let it knock his attack off course. Prepared this time, Naruto let his attack hit the bridge. The force of the punch shattered the stone and sent the entire bridge groaning. The stone splintered and broke off once more. This time many more stone shards scattered in every direction, and the invisible blur was battered by the impromptu attack. Zabuza, his concentration broken, cursed as his invisibility within the mist faded. Naruto wasted no time upon seeing him and cocked his fist back. We can't afford to beat around the bush with this one, the fox muttered. He intends to wear you down. Well I am not sure exactly how possible that is, I'd rather not find out. Red chakra bubbled around Naruto's arm, eventually coming to coalesce around his fist. The red chakra shifted and squirmed around the boy's fist, swirling and whirring and becoming very dangerous. Hum now, Naruto. Naruto, his punch unknowingly augmented by the fox's powers, threw his attack with a minimum amount of effort. The attack flew, and while Naruto's actual punch didn't go very far, the effects of it did. The mist parted under the titanic force of the punch. The ground was cleaved as a fissure was blown into the ground. Trees were uprooted, their roots torn from the ground and left flying in the chaotic windstorm of the displaced air. The sea, not particularly hit by the attack, parted from the ambient force of the blow. And at the center of it all Zabuza's broken body fell to the ground, only barely saved from total annihilation by the now broken Kubikirabacho. We have work to do. Serious series. Serious punch. Akashi stared in abject terror at the scene before him. He had turned his back for not a minute before the mist started seeping in again. At first, the one-eyed ninja thought that the natural mist of the land had started to creep back in, but then the fog started to thicken, and before he could do anything the visibility on the bridge was back to near nothingness. Shit, Kakashi cursed. He was now mentally kicking himself for allowing the newly minted genin to face off against an almost legendary ninja. Sure, Naruto was almost stronger than Guy, but that didn't mean anything. He was still green. He was still just a chill. Sakura, for the second time in about as many minutes, was forced to her knees. The shockwave from the side of the bridge where Naruto and Zabuza were fighting while well, it exploded. It quite literally exploded as the mist was blown away for a second time. That wasn't the only thing blown away, however. The fissure in the ground, small where it started but expanding exponentially outwards from there, went several miles out into the woods. For quite a bit outwards from there, the carnage left debris and desolation everywhere. For anywhere inside of the fissure, there was nothing but total obliteration. Sakura, overwhelmed by the attack, could only gape at the large-scale destruction. I mean, sure, she always knew that Naruto was more powerful than they were on an amazing level, but what sort of power gap? Haku had found it odd that he was knocked out by one earth-shaking attack, only to be awakened by another. Getting up slowly, Haku shook off the soreness granted by being hit with the force of a train and wiped the melting ice shards off his kimono. He didn't have many valuable possessions. He was allowed to cherish the one expensive thing that he owned. That in mind, Haku rose gingerly to his feet. His whole body ached, but he still had to make sure that his state of dress was correct. After making sure he was of the correct attire and ignoring the groans of the unconscious enemies behind him, Haku looked around, only to see that his master lay, crumbled and broken, in a blast cone that spanned out so far into the mainland that he couldn't currently see an end to the destruction. Anger, despair and rage gave way to a kind of cold quiet sensation. All thoughts fled from his mind as his body moved without any conscious effort on his part. Haku's hand reached into his expensive dress and removed the ornate needles that lay nestled in the inner breast pocket with a smooth graceful ease. Taking less than a second to look over them, for they had never been used, Haku was soon in motion. Ice style. Demonic ice mirror, Haku whispered, his voice as frosty as the ice mirror that appeared before him. It was half formed and even then melting in places, but it was good enough for his purposes. The masked ninja took a single, sure step inside of it and then aimed himself at the person standing at the apex of the blast. At the odd, blonde-haired orange-wearing boy. The man that was fighting her master, the copy ninja if Haku remembered correctly, saw what he was doing and tried to stop him. The man deserved his renown because he actually made it pretty far before Haku went flying out of his ice mirror. No matter how fast the jonin was, however, meant little once Haku got moving. As soon as Haku stepped out of his mirror, time seemed to slow down. The world tinted itself blue and it was like life itself was frozen. The copy ninja, his hand outstretched and single red eye opened wide, seemed to freeze in midair as he reached for Haku's mirror. Haku was far past his position now. The pink-haired girl, the useless one, seemed startled by her master's outburst. She was slower on the uptake though and only managed to turn partway to see what was going on. Haku was past her as well, frozen in a state of confusion as she was. Haku noted that their target, the bridge builder Tazuna, was frozen in time as well without a single means of protection. He could kill him right now, and no one would be the wiser. 
The needles in his hand were for a specific person, however, so he let free one made of ice. As soon as it left his hand, however, it too slowed to a crawl. It would reach its target eventually. Finally, Haku zoned in on the object of his newly established hatred. The blonde fool, so simple and stupid and foolish, just stood there, fist outstretched, as if what he had just done wasn't the highest form of crime. This stupid idiotic child would pay for its miraculous murder of his master with blood, and it would do so by the weapon that Haku's master had gifted him. But the swing of his arm, Haku swung the needles clenched between his fingers towards the neck of the soon-to-be-dead blonde. The very first lesson that Master Zabuza had taught him was that no one, bar none, had a strong neck when they were unguarded. This child would be the same. The needles, sharp and ornate with engravings of dragons and lions, inched their way closer and closer to the boy's neck. Haku could almost taste his victory. Then something peculiar happened. Haku, the last member of the Yuki clan, got his speed from judicious use of his bloodline limit. Using his ice, Haku was able to almost freeze time and move at ridiculous speeds. While like this, Haku's perception of the world around him was special, and he saw everything as if it were frozen in his ice. Birds seemed to be stuck in midair on their flight, dew would be eternally falling from the petals of a flower, and even the mist from his master's technique would be suspended in place. To offset the speed, however, Haku too would have to be moving extremely slowly, at least to his own perception, lest he be out of control every time he used it. To the masked teenager, he was moving as slow as a civilian through sap, even though consciously he knew that he was moving near the speed of light. Regardless, Haku was currently moving at speeds the human brain couldn't possibly comprehend. The Sharingan, a cheat of an ability even in the ninja world, could only barely keep up with him, and it was for this reason that Haku was certain that he would be fine in his endeavor. So you can imagine his surprise when the boy, the blue-eyed boy that definitely did not have a Sharingan, turned, in real time, to look at him. What are you doing? The boy asked, again, in real time. Haku's mind boggled at the logistics of it. In order to do such a thing with his perception, the boy would have to have been speaking at speeds greater than light. Haku tried to respond, but even he couldn't get his words out quick enough. The boy didn't seem to particularly mind, though. He just shrugged his shoulders. Then he walked around the still airborne Haku. Did you throw that ice needle? The boy asked. He was somewhere behind Haku, now. Haku couldn't turn to face him fast enough. In fact, his arm was still swinging for neck that was no longer there. I can't have that. It might hit Sakura, and I'm told that she's funny. There was a small clink sound that Haku knew from years of experience to be the breaking of ice. His attack was thwarted and, wait, how could he hear the ice break when he was traveling faster than sound? How could he hear the boy speak? Even sound was too slow for him right now, and yet the boy was talking as if everything was normal. What was going on? Amidst Haku's confusion, the blonde boy walked back over to where Haku was swinging and placed himself back in the path of Haku's arm. He tilted his neck so that the needles would be able to pierce it better, and then waited. I hope for your sake that that actually works, the blonde said. I haven't seen my blood in a while, and that might be the only thing that amuses me enough to spare your life. Haku, who was used to the overwhelming bloodthirst of his master, felt his own mortality. So we're not talking about it. Sasuke asked. They were currently sitting around a table in the bridge builder's house. Tazuna's daughter, Tsunami, had made them all breakfast, and they were eating it rather sedately. No, we're not, Kakashi replied. He picked up a piece of meat from the communal plate at the center of the table and laid it on top of his rice. But I really think we should. Did you see what happened out there? Naruto punched. We're not talking about it, Sasuke. Kakashi wasn't having any of that, so the table went to silence once more. A few moments passed like this before Sasuke couldn't take it anymore. But he broke the woods. I know that we could at least say something about No. Surprisingly it was Sakura who spoke up about that. We're not saying anything about it. Anything at all. But Sasuke started. He was cut off by a surprisingly powerful fist grasping his collar. Before he knew it, he was eye to eye with the unfocused green eyes of his female teammate. Sasuke, I know that you were unconscious for most of it, so let me fill you in. I have seen many an insane thing since I was put on this team. I have seen a man eat with a mask on and everyone looking at him, yet no one seeing his face. The Kashi grunted. Infuriatingly, his food was finished. I have seen a boy somehow display every single innate human emotion incorrectly. Sai so smiled. Something about it was off. No one could tell what, though, and that was the problem. I have seen someone prettier than I am be male. Haku, who was tied up in a corner of the house, grunted. Boys can be pretty too. Sakura shot him a withering glare. The boy shut up. The pincat found his reaction satisfying and turned back to her teammate. I have seen many a mind-boggling thing, and yet I had still come out sane. What happened on that bridge today breaks even my suspension of disbelief, and as such, I need some time to cope. You will give me that, or so help me, I will make you wish that you were in that crater when it exploded. 
Sasuke, smartly, shut up once more, and the room devolved back into silence once again. There was a scream of pain outside. Can you guys just tell me why we're letting Naruto deal with Gato and his men, then? Sasuke asked. There was a collective shrug, and it was actually the bridge builder's grandson, a boy by the name of Inari, who responded. Well, we were prepared to fight them, me and the other townsfolk, but your friend just got this look on his face when he saw them and ran off. He said something about finally finding bandits and real adventure and barreled right into them. Inari then looked down at his food. He picked at it a bit before continuing. After seeing the blast area, none of us had it in us to stop him. There was another scream outside. Seeing as the team had left Naruto at the bridge, which was several miles away from where they currently were, this was impressive. Unless, of course, you feel like telling him to stop. Sasuke and the rest of the people at the table decided to leave Gato's thugs to Naruto. The four members of Team 7 moved in relative silence through the forest. Kakashi, of course, was taking point, making sure to keep his normal eye open and alert, in turn keeping so that there were no untoward threats to harm the rest of his team. Not like there was anything even remotely foolhardy enough to attack them as they were now. Naruto, Sakura said, her voice being barely a whisper. How far does this crater go? The blonde-haired boy shrugged. He shifted the package he had on his back before keeping pace. Sakura, long used to the quiet boy by now, nodded her head. She stared ahead, keeping her green eyes on the horizon. I'm not going to question it. I'm just going to walk, and I refuse to do anything else until I get home and have a long nap. The group then continued to walk in silence, all while skirting along the edge of the crater that Naruto had made in his fight with Zabuza. It coincidentally ran along most of their path back to the Hidden Leaf Village. Behind Kakashi was Naruto, walking without a care in the world. Behind even him was the three official members of Team 7. They were rather quiet for the trip. This is much farther than I thou, Sakura's hand lashed out. She held a finger to Sasuke's lips and prevented him from talking. I am walking, Sasuke. I refuse to do anything else until I get home and have a long nap. Sasuke nodded. It wasn't long until Team 7 returned to the village. Getting through the gates was somewhat harder, what with Naruto's package, but overall the process was simple. Sakura quickly outpaced her team. She turned immediately and regarded the boys. Not that I didn't have an immense amount of fun on our first mission outside of the village, but I'm going to be spending some time alone with my family. Sasuke raised an eyebrow while Naruto tilted his head. They were confused but decided that discretion would be the better road to take. You take whatever time you need, Kakashi said. He turned to the other members of his squad. Let's go, boys. Kakashi set off and the other two boys followed him. Sai, however, stayed behind. He stared at Sakura for a moment before smiling. Are you taking time off in order to get away from the oddity that is our team? Sakura sighed. Sai just had to be the one to bring up what everyone else seemed to implicitly get. She pinched the bridge of her nose in order to stave off the coming headache. Got it in one, ace. The third Hokage was a worldly old man. He had knowledge and wisdom beyond even his impressive years and had likely forgotten more than most people would ever know. As such, he was a man who would quickly notice trends and react accordingly. The trend that he had recently noticed was that Naruto tended to do things that would boggle minds. Naruto, the Hokage started. His question was on the tip of his tongue, but one look at the blonde's blank face told him all that he needed to know on how that question was going to be answered. Instead, he directed the question to another. Kakashi, why is there a young man tied up and strapped to Naruto's back? Kakashi, who was doing his best to ignore the situation, tore his attention away from his book. That's his package, Kakashi answered, as if what he said was as commonplace as the weather. And why does he have such a package? The Hokage asked. Bakashi shrugged. This time he did not look away from the book. He said that he wanted it. I couldn't find it in me to say no. The Hokage was at a loss for words. You were his Jonin commander. You had operational authority. To be fair, Lord Hokage, no one ever told me that. He's a Jonin, the Hokage stressed. And a child to boot. Why would you ever assume that he would have any sort of equal status to yourself? In response Kakashi's eye trailed over to the blonde kid. He stood motionless and quiet in the middle of the room and did not speak unless addressed. I remembered what happened to Guy. The Hokage couldn't bring himself to argue that point. Regardless, what's happening here is an extreme violation of protocol. We do not let random individuals into the village without going through the proper regulations. And we definitely do not kidnap them without reason. The Hokage rubbed at his temple. How did you even get him past the gate? It was Sasuke's turn to speak up. Naruto spoke to them. The Hokage's old tired eyes darted to the last Ichiha. And what exactly did he say? If I remember correctly, Sasuke started, he said that this is his package, and he wanted to keep it sir. The Hokage turned back to Kakashi. And that worked. Kakashi nodded. The guards couldn't find it in themselves to stop him. The Hokage rolled his eyes. 
As usual, it appeared that he would have to take matters into his own hands. Naruto, the old man started. You can't just kidnap people. Naruto, his face once again blank, just shrugged. I didn't kidnap him. He's my package. Aku, tied and gagged on the blonde's back, tried to talk, but the bandages in his mouth made that a difficult endeavor. The third Hokage just sighed. You can't make random people into your package. That's very frowned upon. Naruto tilted his head. But why? He tried to kill me, so he's an enemy. He what now? Aku was an enemy ninja. The Hokage turned on Kakashi. You let him bring an enemy shinobi into the village. Kakashi, finally fed up with the questioning, closed his book. If you can take the boy from him, then by all means, punish me. The Hokage looked back at Naruto. The blonde was clutching the enemy shinobi to his chest now, almost like a teddy bear. Said enemy shinobi looked only a little perturbed. The Hokage sighed. I'll summon Guy. Sasuke rubbed his eyes as he exited the Hokage tower. Faintly, in the distance, he could hear the cries of youth as Guy tried to overcome the monster that was Uzumaki Naruto. Hum, young Naruto. I have been training hard for our rematch. Gate of Wonder. Open. Sasuke braced himself as an earthquake bled through the local area. A supersonic boom then rang out, signaling the clash between the green beast and Naruto. The two were likely far away, but even now Sasuke could imagine Naruto's face. The boy would be bored, incredibly so, as he humored one of the few people to ever even slightly push him. With a sigh, Sasuke returned to his feet and set off to his home. Ever since the massacre of his clan by his now estranged brother, he was living in an apartment complex. I was useless, the last Ichiha grumbled. His fists clenched at his sides, and he could already feel his nails making indents in his palms. I thought that I was getting stronger, but I'm not. But that package made me look stupid. He made me look weak. Sasuke then looked up. In the air, over the skies of the Hidden Leaf Village, shockwaves rang out from invisible clashes. Naruto and Guy were moving too fast to see. Sasuke squinted, then activated his Sharingan, only to be able to see the barest of blurs. They're so fast. Sasuke gaped. Directly above him, Naruto and Guy exchanged a particularly strong blow, and the two recoiled from the force of their strikes. Stuck midair from the momentum, Sasuke could now see the unapologetic grin on Guy's face as he reveled in the action. Young Naruto. Our honorable Lord Hokage has asked me to bring you in, and I shall. Guy yelled. Even though he was so very far above the kingdom, his voice was loud enough to be heard throughout. Naruto didn't respond. He adjusted a very much unconscious Haku on his back before repositioning himself. Once they had recovered, the two superhumans kicked the air and were little more than blurs once more. Sasu clenched his teeth. This was the level of power he needed to reach, at a minimum, in order to avenge his clan. With a deep breath, the young Ichiha deactivated his Sharingan. He needed to be better, and he had an idea where he would need to start. Honey, are you alright? Sakura's mom, Mibuki, asked. Her daughter had returned home not five hours ago, and all she had done since then was lie her head down on the kitchen counter. I'm fine, mom. Sakura answered. Her voice was muffled by both her arms and the wood of the counter. I just have a really, really bad headache. Mibuki hummed. Turning her attention back to the dishes, she attempted to finish the house chores. Sakura wasn't around to do them anymore now that she was busy with ninja stuff. Mibuki knew nothing about it, so she decided to let Sakura rest. That she was resting for so long was worrying. Are you sure that it's just a headache, dear? Mibuki had had some terrible headaches in her days. They were especially horrible around certain times of the month. Nothing was this serious, though. Sakura hadn't even said a word until just now. Her daughter sighed. Finally, she lifted her head from the table to stare at her mom. Mibuki almost gasped when she saw her daughter's eyes. The normally vibrant green orbs were blank, almost desolate. Mom. What's the oddest thing that you have ever seen? Mibuki wanted to respond with the fact that her daughter had naturally bright pink hair, despite the fact that neither her nor her husband did but decided not to. Sakura continued anyway. Have you ever seen someone punch a fisher into the ground? Mibuki hesitated. That wasn't something that was normal. The things that ninjas did or could do was certainly never normal. I'm pretty sure that Mr. Tsunade of the Sanin could do such a thing. No, no, Sakura said, her head hurting all the more for reliving the event. Not punching the ground. He didn't do that. He punched at the air, and the force behind it was so strong that the ground was affected. Have you ever seen that? Mabuki, the smart and scientifically gifted woman that she was, frowned. That's impossible, dear. The logic behind how much force that would need is staggering. The person throwing the punch would quite literally be evaporated under the energy and heat required to throw it. Finally Mabuki got a response out of her daughter as Sakura threw her hands in the air. I know. That's what I said. And yet that's what happened. He punched at a person and destroyed the landscape. For miles. It doesn't make any sense. Mabuki blanched. For miles. That's impossible. 
Miguki made her way over to her daughter. She placed a hand on Sakura's forehead. It was as warm as she suspected. You have a fever, honey. I'm sure that's the problem. Sakura batted her mother's hand away. Her face scrunched up as she scowled at the woman she thought was the person she was closest to. All too suddenly Sakura was realizing that her mother, the woman who used to be her bastion of support, was quickly becoming anything but. Ibuki still loved her and wanted what was best for her, of that she was sure. But Sakura could no longer come to her with all of her issues anymore. Sakura was a ninja now, and what was quickly becoming a normal thing to her was a fantastical thing heard of only in legends to her mother. No, mom, Sakura started. Her voice was a little shaky, but she hoped that she was controlling it well enough that her mother hadn't noticed. Mibuki already looked scandalized from Sakura's actions. I think that I might just be a little tired, is all. Is my room clean? Mibuki looked concerned and just the slightest bit confused. Regardless, she nodded her head and turned. Mostly, she responded. I hadn't had the chance to change your bed sheets as of yet. Can you wait here until I do? Sure, Sakura said. She tried smiling, but it was at best a weary thing. I'll just rest here until you're done. Babuki smiled back. It, too, wasn't one of her best, but at the very least it seemed like Sakura's mom was appreciative of the gesture. Ever since Sakura started going to the academy, she was becoming more and more independent. Cleaning Sakura's room was one of the few things that Mibuki could do for her daughter, and Sakura was determined to let her do it. I'll be right back, Mibuki said. With a quick shake of her hands the housewife dried herself and made off to prepare her daughter's room for her. Sakura smiled at her until she was effectively out of sight. Then she collapsed, her energy leaving her. She would drag herself back up from the counter when she heard her mom coming, but for now she would rest. Even mom doesn't believe me. Sakura then sighed. In front of her was a plate of toast and eggs that her mother had prepared for her. Team 7 had returned to the village quite early and had therefore been just in time for breakfast. Sakura hadn't touched it, not even once. Maybe I should just start training more, Sakura mumbled. She buried her face in her folded arms. Naruto and Sasuke and the rest of them are all so much stronger than me. Maybe if I'm stronger, then they'll be forced to believe me. I bet Ino wouldn't be having this much trouble. I bet Ino would be. Sakura's voice faded out as her headache worsened. Her eyes drooped and she slowly fell asleep. She lied there, dozing and calm, until suddenly she twitched. Thinking nothing of it, Sakura let herself fall back to sleep. In front of her, her eggs levitated just slightly off the counter. I collapsed, his chest heaving as he tried to catch his breath. Sweat dripped down his face like waterfalls and his eyes drooped every so often. But in his clutches was the package that his hokage asked him to get. Guy's smile couldn't be wider. Young Naruto. I have done it. This game is mine. Naruto, upon hearing Guy, turned and stared at the man. Then he reached for his back and seemed genuinely confused that Haku was no longer there. The boy then glared at Guy, the action a rare moment of real emotion from him. Naruto pointed, his finger acting as both an accusation and a death toll. With a voice as calm as a lake and as deadly as a guillotine he spoke. Mine. I recoiled. For reasons he could not comprehend, he felt as if a rope was tightening around his neck. Young Naruto, are you? I didn't finish the statement before Naruto was on top of him. The Ashi Uga wasn't a man that was easily surprised. After becoming the head of his clan at 21, the earliest of any clan head in Uga history, he was used to the unusual. He had become quite adept at parsing the extraordinary from the Asinine and was as such deemed as one of the most capable leaders his clan had ever produced. And then Yuzumaki Naruto decided to go from brash and annoying to silent and powerful during a single year. Hiashi had heard rumors of him overpowering Might Guy, a man that even he had to admit was strong. It was said that before Naruto even left the academy he was causing untold destruction. Hiashi, of course, believed none of this. He was a pragmatic, skeptical man by reputation. It was a reputation well deserved, and thus while everyone else was obviously in awe of the earth-rending, air-tearing catastrophe of a fight that was currently happening over the village between Guy and what was supposed to be Naruto, Hiashi was sipping his tea and looking over his clan's financial records. His silent denial was as strong as his tojutsu. It was during his most recent denial, the 34th random earthquake to shake the village that day, that a knock came to his door. Hiashi grunted, a sound that, although low, cut through the silence of his study like a knife. The door opened, his servants knowing his mannerisms, and in stepped a member of the branch clan of the Hayuga. The Hayuga clan member bowed deeply at the waist upon entering. Lord Hiashi, I apologize for disturbing you, but you have a visitor. Hiashi raised an eyebrow, but otherwise kept his face completely passive. And you allowed him entry. Is it the Hokage? The branch member, to his credit, didn't quake under his leader's annoyance. He simply swallowed his trepidation and continued. Hiashi was proud. That was how a true Hayuga should be. It is not. But I figured that it was still a person of interest. I would never disturb you for anything else. 
the ash he let his surprise wash over him. This particular branch member was the most trusted of his attendants. His talents were quite honestly wasted in the lesser half of the clan, but that was the circumstances of one's birth. Regardless, he was still quite talented and had a judgment process similar to Hiashi himself. Therefore Hiashi trusted that whoever this person was would probably be at the very least entertaining. Who is it, then? Hiashi asked. The man, recognizing the acceptance, allowed himself to straighten. It is the last of the Achiha. Sasu Achiha, my lord. This time Hiashi let his surprise show in the ever so slight raise of both of his eyebrows. Now that was interesting. You may let him enter. The branch member bowed once more and let himself out. Hiashi had just enough time to put away his paperwork before another knock rapped on his door. This time Hiashi called out that it was okay to enter. Sasuke Chiha stalked into the room like a shadow, and instantly Hiashi was on guard. This didn't feel like a child he was dealing with. This felt like a seasoned politician. His eyes were sharp, too sharp, and Hiashi knew that he was a man on a mission. Sasuke sat at Hiashi's table opposite him. There was no pomp or ceremony in his actions, only a calm efficiency. Lord Hayuga, the boy said. Two simple words, and yet so calculated. The boy was letting Hiashi, as was correct as he was in the Hayuga's house, start the conversation. Achiha, Hiashi responded, acknowledging the boy before him. Well, he shouldn't refer to him as a boy. He was a ninja now, despite being the lowest tier. The boy was expected to be able to kill, and thus was an adult. What brings you to my residence? The young man seemed to be contemplating what to say, but Hiashi had to give him props for not breaking eye contact. The silence stretched on for a couple seconds more, Hiashi calmly weathering the social foss bar. Just before it reached a critical point, however, another freak earthquake rumbled through the village. Hiashi calmly ignored it with another sip of tea. The Achiha did not. There, that, Sasuke said. He pointed up, towards the ceiling, but Hiashi knew that he was referring to what was happening outside. Currently my teammate is outside fighting off one of the strongest people I have ever seen. Your teammate? Hiashi asked. It was common knowledge who inherited the very cursed role of the new Team 7. On one hand Hiashi was upset because Team 7's notorious reputation as being bad luck made it hard to play coy. On another hand Hiashi was happy that he was one more generation away from the bad luck that being on that team afforded. Being Minato's teammate was never a boring time. It was also rarely a painless time. The look on the young Ichiha's face made it clear that he was annoyed at Hiashi's game. Regardless, he barely let that irritation show on his face. Instead he huffed and continued as if he believed Hiashi's words. Naruto Uzumaki. He's above the village fighting guy. It was around now that the branch attendant returned. In his hands he held a silver platter with an ornate tea set perched on top. Hiashi noticed that it wasn't quite the tea set they brought out when important guests, such as Fire Country Nobility, visited, but it still wasn't the worst of what they had. But the attendant even deigned to bring any spoke volumes. Maybe this was more important than he thought. Sasuke accepted the tea in stride and sipped quietly while the branch member refilled Hiashi's cup. They let the silence reign while they enjoyed the tea. After a few minutes Hiashi decided to continue the conversation. Yes, I have heard that guy has moved on to combating a certain ninja. What does that have to do with the nature of your visit, if I may ask? Sasuke placed his teacup, emptied but not drained, on the associated platter. Do you know the nature of our previous mission? Hiashi shook his head. No, I wouldn't know the nature of a random genin team's mission. Hiashi knew exactly what happened on that mission. Team 7's first mission out of the village was almost always a point of discussion. Hiashi remembered his first mission out of the village. The less could be said about it the better. Sasu continued on, ignoring the look on Hiashi's face. It was one of extreme discomfort. We came across the demon of the hidden mist. Zabuza Mamachi was our enemy. And quite a formidable enemy, indeed. Hiashi was uncertain of even his own ability to overcome such an opponent. With practiced grace, Hiashi turned to sip from his tea once more. Incredible. Seeing as how you're here I can assume that you all overcame him. Kakashi has proven his ability once more. Kakashi wasn't the one to beat him. It was Naruto. Hiashi glided over that comment like a professional ice skater. And you, you managed to defeat his apprentice, no. Sasuke's eyes narrowed. For someone who didn't know about the mission, it's amazing that you know about Zabuza's apprentice when I hadn't even brought him up. Hiashi didn't deign to acknowledge that statement. Sasuke continued. But no, I hadn't done that either. It was Naruto who beat him as well. Hiashi, who was desperately trying to hang on to his sanity, gently placed his cup down and reached for the tea kettle. Look, Lord Hayuga, the simple matter is that Naruto is strong. He's stronger than most anyone I know. He's even stronger than our sensei, though Kakashi won't admit it. Right now he's outside sparring guy to a standstill, and he probably isn't even going to be tired for it. He's stronger than me, than guy and probably even Kakashi. 
He has pure strength that rivals even a hokage, and maybe, Sasuke trailed off. He looked as if the next words would truly pain him to even say. He might even be strong enough to beat Itachi. The Ashi was truly surprised for once. As long as he'd known the Ichiha, they were never able to admit inferiority. And what does that have to do with me, Ichiha? Sasuke, his eyes downcast, brought his gaze up to meet the Hyuga leader. His onyx eyes turned red and, reflexively, veins appeared around Hiashi's. The two mighty Dejutsu users stared each other down, both tense as they waited the other's move. I can never overpower Naruto in pure strength. I know that now, after seeing him punch a hole into the countryside. The Ashi's eye twitched. I can grow stronger, more and more with no end in sight, but no matter what I do I can never grow stronger than that monstrosity out there. But where I cannot outpace him in power, perhaps I can in skill. Sasuke then looked at Hiashi. He deactivated his Sharingan. There is no one more proficient in skill in the village than you. You will be my teacher in skill in martial arts. With your teaching I can outpace Naruto, and with that, my treacherous brother. And why should I teach you? Hiashi asked. You have given me no reason to believe in you. The Hyuga techniques are a closely guarded secret, taught only to the members of our clan. Even if I were to teach you, it would only be a shadow of its true potential. The gentle fist can only be properly used alongside the Byakugan. Sasuke smirked. I believe my Sharingan can make up for the loss. The Ashi frowned. I refuse. And in doing so you lose the chance to prove to the entire village the superiority of the gentle fist style. The Ashi frowned harder. Continue. Sasuke, seeing his chance leaned forward. His grin was predatory, very thin and showing far too many teeth. Everyone already knows that the gentle fist is the best jutsu style in Konoha. What they think they know is that the gentle fist is from the efforts of the Byakugan. They think it is a style that is solely based on a very specific bloodline. A cheat ability, if you will. The Ashi huffed. And would they be wrong? It is a fighting style made for the Hyuga, by the Hyuga. If there was a more focused fighting style, I haven't heard of it. Why should I care what others think of my family's ability? However specialized it is, it works. Well, yes, Sasuke acceded. My apologies then, Lord Hiashi. I had come here expecting a man of ambition. If you are content with where you are, then I see no need to continue this conversation. Sasuke then rose. By your leave. The Ashi scowled. Sit, Ichiha. What do you mean? Sasuke stopped moving but didn't quite sit. I mean that the Ichiha are on the rise again. Right now, it is just me, but in the future, after I've surely beaten Itachi, it will be much more than just me. I will have an entire clan again, strong and serving Konoha, and we will all be in debt to you. Right now, Lord Hyuga, you are sitting on the precipice of history. This could be the moment where two of the greatest clans of Konoha join hands to achieve a Tejutsu style, beyond what the world has ever seen. Or it could be a lost opportunity. The choice lies with you. The Ashi's eyes narrowed, though he did contemplate the thought. He couldn't allow the Hyuga techniques to fall into the hands of another clan, but it wasn't like there weren't emulators of it already. Like he said, the Hyuga fighting style had always been a tradition of the clan, and as such was barely changing. It was around for generations. There were bound to be those that both attempted to copy and counter it, with limited success. This however. This would be a tradition-breaking, near unheard of precedence. Hiashi would be agreeing to outright teach this outsider the strengths, and thereby weaknesses, of his clan's primary means of combat. It was a dangerous, even risky move. But it was one that held merit. And if I do choose to help you. What do I gain? Sasuke smiled. You were around far longer than I, Lord Hiashi. You have probably seen the Ichiha in action. We have a fighting style as well. The Ashi allowed a smirk to cross his features. The boy was interesting. It is a fighting style of trickery and thievery. You steal the techniques of your opponent mid-battle and use it against them. Effective, but underhanded, and hardly something that we can use. We do not have the capabilities of the copy we lie. True, but there is more to it than just that. We do copy the techniques of our enemies, but no castle stands without a firm foundation. You can't stand against an enemy with no leg to fight on. Oh? Hiashi asked. And what fighting style do you purport this to be? Do this, Sasuke retrieved a scroll from his pocket. It bore the Ichiha crest on it. He placed it on the table and slid it over to the Hyuga Lord. I transcribed the most basic katas from the Ichiha Interceptor style to Jutsu. You may keep that. Call it a gesture of good faith. The Ashi wasted no time in opening and looking over the scroll. Like Sasuke said, it was nothing but the most basic of forms, but what it did show told enough. So it is a style of evading and redirecting attacks, Hiashi started. He rolled the scroll up and put it to the side. I'm assuming so that you can survive long enough pick apart the enemy's fighting style. Yes, Sasu confirmed. But it is also so I can pick apart the enemy. It is a strong, mostly defensive style that allows an Ichiha to make use of our Jinjutsu and Ninjutsu more effectively. 
admittedly, we Ichiha are comparatively weak in Tijutsu, however small that comparison is. If I want to overcome Naruto, however, an explosion ripped through the skies of the Hidden Leaf Village. Wind chimes located just outside the window of Hiashi's study rattled violently. The Ashi steadfastly ignored it. Sasuke did not. I can't be weak in any way. The Ashi hummed. He sipped from his tea. I see, but that all fails to mention how this style would help me. The Hayuga do well enough dodging and punishing attacks. I might even say better. How does your style benefit my own? In the simpler aspects, Lord Hayuga. Oh? Imagine this, Sasuke started. You are fighting multiple opponents, some are armed, and some are attacking in the back with ninjutsu and weapons. This is a difficult situation for you, is it not? The Ashi nodded, deciding not to bring up the heavenly rotation. Imagine if you had the interceptor style. You could use the Hayuga's smooth and fluid movements with the Ichiha's direct and disarming specifics to not only dodge the attacks, but turn their own against them. You combine the fluidity of one style with the precise, striking deadliness of the other. Not bad, no. The Ashi nodded. Your words have merit, young man. Sasuke felt his hopes rise. But you haven't sold me. Sasuke frowned. He opened his mouth, ready to argue more, when Hiashi held up a hand. But you have intrigued me. At the very least, you have impressed me with your diplomacy. Hiashi then reached for the Ichiha scroll. He held it aloft in one hand. At the very least, I owe you for your good faith. I will help you incorporate at least this much of our style into yours, while you teach some of yours to ours. Depending on how well it goes, we will proceed from there. That is fair, is it not? Sasuke, once more finding hope in a lost situation, smiled. His professional exterior broke for the first time that meeting, and he ashy found himself grinning, just a little, at the unabashed childish glee that shone through on the young man's face. Sasuke schooled his features as best he could before responding. Yes Lord Hayuga. That is more than fair. The Ichiha then rose from his seat. We can cover the specifics of our meeting at a later date. It is getting rather late, and I suppose that you want your rest. The Ashi nodded, amused at what he now realized was the young man's utmost best at professionalism. He watched as the Ichiha made his way to the door, before calling out. Ichiha, he Ashi said. One last question. What do you intend to call this style? Sasu raised an eyebrow. I didn't assume that you would let the naming of our fused style fall to me. Humor me. Sasuke, obviously not expecting this, hummed. He turned, having been facing the door, and said. For now, how about we call it the flowing water rock smashing fist? I collapsed just outside the Hokage Tower. Haku, somehow still bound despite the supersonic clash he just survived, fell out of the green beast's tired, limp hands. He was immediately picked up by a nonplussed Naruto. Mine. Upstairs, looking out the window of the tower, the third Hokage sighed deeply. Anada Hayuga, the failed heiress of the Hayuga clan, was walking down the streets of the Hidden Leaf Village. It was a good day, with nice weather and decent humidity. Despite being called the land of fire it was actually a pretty rainy area, with decent periods of constant rain that fed the abundant forest surrounding the village. Luckily it wasn't one of those rainy periods, and the sun was shining brightly directly overhead, and there was nary a cloud in sight. But the smile on her face Hinata Hayuga roamed down the street, her feet on the ground, but her head somewhere else. Not for the first time was she thinking about her favorite person. Not for the first time was she wondering how Naruto Uzumaki was doing. I hope he's been eating, Hinata pondered. Reflexively she clenched her hand, reminiscent of the way she used to do when she made cinnamon buns back in the academy. I'm not around to feed him anymore. He might forget. True enough, back in the academy, Hinata had befriended the blonde enigma. Back then she was so shy and couldn't bring herself to talk to anyone. Then Naruto walked in, and suddenly Hinata felt invigorated. It was like he was a sun, projecting light and energy and all the nutrients Hinata needed to grow. Naruto was strong, he was powerful, and he was everything that Hinata wanted to be. Hinata was, of course, smitten immediately. So, now smitten, Hinata did something very uncharacteristic of her. She waved to the boy. He did not wave back. Hinata felt her spirits crash to the ground and shatter in a million pieces. It was a stupid idea. She never should have tried to make friends. Melancholy, the young Hayuga Academy student rushed out into the yard to have her food under the tree on the hill overlooking the academy yard. She had maybe three seconds to herself before someone was standing before her. Hinata jumped, almost upending the contents of her bento everywhere. With a trained, albeit slightly flawed, Hayuga Grace, Hinata managed to catch everything before looking up to this mysterious person in front of her. Whoever it was, they weren't there a couple of seconds ago and certainly hadn't walked up to her. They just appeared. Looking up, Hinata was surprised to see a blonde-haired, blue-eyed cutie looking down on her. His eyes, they were emotionless, but not cold. Instead they seemed confused, as if they weren't quite sure what they were looking at. Naruto Uzumaki, the boy who rebuffed her advances, tilted his head. 
His nose scrunched, as if he had smelled something unpleasant, and for a second Hinata thought that she had somehow messed up yet again. Then the boy extended his hand. He did an action that looked like an attempt at a smile, but he gave up on that endeavor rather quickly. Garama said that it is polite to respond to people when they say hi, he said. He then scowled, but for some reason Hinata felt like he wasn't scowling at her. But I already know that. I just didn't want to say hi to you. Hinata frowned, and she could feel the tears coming to her eyes. Even Naruto didn't want to be friends with her. But she had only been in class for a day. Naruto then shook his head. No, that was the wrong way to say that, I think. I don't want to say hi to you because I don't like talking to people, not because there's something wrong with you. I don't even know you, yet. Hinata felt a little relieved at that. She pulled her hand into the sleeve of her jacket and tried to use it to wipe at the tears before they fell. Before she could, however, Naruto's hand zipped out and grabbed it. Hirama says that I should shake your hand and introduce myself properly. He says that it's the proper thing to do, so I'm going to do it. He then shook her hand vigorously, though awkwardly. There, it's done. Hinata, thoroughly confused by what was happening, was too distracted to try to stop the tear from falling from her eyes. For some reason Naruto winced, as if someone was yelling into his ears. Hirama says that I should apologize to you and that making girls cry is bad. But I know that, too. The boy then looked around. You, uh, want to get some ice cream or something. Hinata, now too confused to be shy, looked down at her bento. Her next words more fell out of her mouth than were actually said. But I'm still eating lunch. You're not supposed to eat dessert before you finish your meal. And it was like a light bulb went off in Naruto's head. His eyes widened considerably and he collapsed on his knees. His face darted forward, uncomfortably close to Hinata's, before his words were blurted from his mouth. Really? I didn't know that. I don't know a lot of things about the way that people are supposed to act. And just like that, Hinata's fear and shyness bled away to an almost motherly concern. You don't? The heiress asked. Didn't your mother teach you how to act? Naruto shook his head. I don't have a mom. I never did. Hinata didn't know what to say to that. It took her a couple of minutes to respond. And what about your dad? She asked. Didn't he teach you? Dad? Naruto asked. What is that? Can I eat it? It was horrifying how hard it was to tell if Naruto was joking. Once more Hinata was left speechless. WH Hinata started. Would you like me to teach you? How to act like a person, that is Hinata asked. She wasn't prepared for Naruto's enthusiastic reply. It was the most emotion she had ever seen from him before and since. Yes, I would. And from that moment onwards, Hinata attempted to teach Naruto how to be a person. It was a grueling and difficult endeavor, and sometimes Hinata was certain that all of her efforts had been in vain. Then Naruto gifted her a flower one day, because he remembered that it was good to give people things that they liked whenever you were grateful for the things they did. Hinata's heart fluttered, and she didn't know whether she was happy that a boy gifted her something, or proud that her little caterpillar was growing up into a social butterfly. That was all months ago now. Naruto was off on his own, and Hinata only ever got to see him in glimpses around the village. He looked to be doing alright, with his usual boundless energy, but she still worried. That being said, Hinata wasn't the only one with an influence on her peer. Naruto had an influence on her as well, with one of the benefits being towards her confidence. Well, maybe if you were just a bit more forceful, people would stop picking on you. Naruto then turned back to the cinnamon bun that Hinata made for him. Kaiban used to say that people only pick on you because they can. You should not let them do it. And from that day forward Hinata was a little more forceful. Just a little. She beat her younger sister Hanabi in a spar, like she always could but was too afraid to, and instantly her standing and her family was raised. Maybe you aren't a lost cause, Hiyashi Hayuga, Hinata's father, said while stroking his chin. Maybe. Yes, Naruto was a positive influence on her as well. He was also a negative influence. Hinata, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, Naruto. I just wish that the mountain range was slightly to the side, sometimes. Relaxing in the sun during the break would be so much better if the sun could actually shine on us and not the mountain. Naruto then got up and moved the mountain. On that day Hinata learned that the world didn't make sense sometimes. Which was why when a creature, seemingly made of a viscous sentient goo burst out of the alleyway she was about to walk by, Hinata barely blinked. Oh, was all she got out before the creature lunged at her. Sakura was a genius. This was apparent from the moment she learned how to read it too, and was made doubly so when she was accepted to the ninja academy as a civilian at age 4. While not practically gifted, Sakura grasped theoretical and academic concepts rather quickly and could figure out conjecture with just a couple hours of exposure. Sakura was a genius. So when she was presented with a gift that, as far as she knew, no one else had, she started to dissect it with almost no hesitation. I wonder what the limit is, Sakura pondered. She twirled her finger, and the empty glass of water twirled in the air as well, enchanted by Sakura's abilities. 
Can I only lift small things, or can I lift horses? Can I lift houses? Sakura's mind drifted, and with it, her concentration on the glass. The cup wobbled in the air for a bit before dropping suddenly. Before it hit the ground, however, Sakura's ninja instincts kicked in. Her hand zipped out and grabbed at the cup, rescuing it from a shattering fate. It requires more concentration than I thought, Sakura pondered. But I suppose that's a fair trade-off for such a low chakra consumption rate. The pinket then placed a finger on her chin. I wonder if this is a dormant bloodline limit within my family, or is this something that is awakened within me? Whatever the reason, Sakura's thoughts were plagued by yet more thoughts, none of which were her own. As that Sakura started. She leaned closer to the window, but she wasn't listening with her ears. She was listening to the thoughts that were screaming to her from elsewhere. Is someone being kidnapped? After listening very hard, something that was nigh impossible considering the jumbling thoughts that were floating through the air from the many villagers, Sakura could confirm that, yes, someone was being abducted. Naturally, Sakura's first instinct was to sit back down. She lived in a ninja village. It wasn't too odd for one of the roaming ninja to be assigned with a less than savory retrieval quest. After listening for just a little bit more, however, Sakura could tell something was odd. Is the person being apathetic? Now, this revelation was especially astonishing to Sakura for one very important reason. The pure apathy she was sensing was borderline ridiculous, especially considering the fact that they were in a hostage situation. True enough, the other person involved in the kidnapping the kidnapper was incredibly confused as to what was going on. There were only three people in the village who could possibly be so apathetic to a hostile situation. Sakura immediately crossed Naruto off the list, however. There was no way in hell anything was successfully kidnapping the boy who could single-handedly change the geography. If he was being kidnapped, then it was because he was letting it happen, and as such was no cause for concern. Ironically, it was for the same reason that Sakura crossed Kakashi off the list. The man would be more bemused than anything that someone was attempting to kidnap him. And even if he was being successfully kidnapped, Sakura felt no pressing need to go save him. The man, skilled as he was, was a raging pervert and a huge asshole. He could sort himself out of whatever mess he was in. So that only left one option. Ugh, Hinata. How do you keep finding yourself in these situations? Sakura asked while trying to staunch the coming headache. Of course it was Hinata who was in trouble. Ever since she had gotten involved with who Sakura was coming to acknowledge as the most insane person she would ever meet, Hinata had started to become desensitized to the supernatural things that happened around her. Of course she would react to being kidnapped with boredom. She had seen a boy move a mountain for her, and not in the romantic sense. But the sigh, Sakura rose from her seat and got herself dressed. If she didn't intervene, then the poor girl would probably be halfway to the cloud village before she realized that she was in danger. Right before she left, however, Sakura had a thought. Turning away from her door and towards her bedroom window, Sakura let a grim smile crawl onto her face. Well, there's no real harm in trying, is there? And like that the girl made her way over to the window and pried it open. Cool air rushed into her stuffy room, buffeting her face and rustling her long pink hair. With a thought to cut it when she got home, Sakura flung herself out of the window. A sense of euphoria overcame her as she fell from the second story of her house. Sakura splayed her limbs outwards as she fell, reveling in the freedom of the weightless experience. The ground approached her quickly, but Sakura never once feared for her safety. Sure enough, a light blue film of energy engulfed her before she hit the ground. Now suspended in place by her own telekinetic powers, Sakura let out an initially unsteady laugh. She soon broke down into hysterics, however, marveling at the usage of her powers. I have so much to go over, she pondered, and almost let her mind roam. But first, I need to save Hinata. And with that thought in mind, Sakura willed herself through the air to where she thought she sensed her friend. Sasuke slid forward, his moves more of a graceful dance than a lunge. Quickly he advanced towards the stationary form of Hiyashi Hayuga. The man's face was carved from stone as he waited in one of the Hayuga's standard gentle fist forms. Though Sasuke's own stance was similar, his was more of a combination of styles. The flowing water rock crushing fist. This is it. Sasuke grunted, his voice as much of a yell as was allowed in the Hayuga household. His arm, bent like a snake, whipped out to strike at the man. At the end of its extension, his own wrist whipped forward as well, prepared to both dodge and redirect. Hiyashi's eyes, focused as they were without the Byakugan, narrowed slightly as he waited until the last possible moment. When that moment came the two, elder and younger, slid into a precise dance. Hiyashi moved with the fluidity and grace afforded to a master of the gentle fist, while Sasuke moved with a similar grace, though he often shifted into precise strikes and measured redirections. After about two minutes Sasuke faltered. He overestimated how much he redirected Hiyashi's blow, and as such was unprepared for the man's spin. That same redirected hand moved with a man, ending in a backhand so strong that the young Ichiha ended up flying through the air. Hiyashi, just barely winded, allowed the Ichiha to rise. 
Sasuke did so after a short moment and, instead of being upset, schooled his face and bowed. It seems that I still don't have the style down quite yet, Sasuke said. His voice was just barely above a whisper and his eyes were trained on the floor. The ashy allowed a small smirk to grace his lips. I wouldn't expect you to. You have just barely begun to learn the style after just having made it. If you had already begun to master it, I would fear for the sanctity of all future Kinoichi. When Sasuke looked up, confused but not offended, Hiyashi continued. Most experienced female ninja prefer a strong, talented partner. A genius with a knack for creating and mastering fighting styles would be a catch. Sasuke, noticing the rare but not unwelcome joke from the older man, just smiled. Perhaps, but I have no interest in that right now. I have to become stronger. Stronger than Naruto and then Itachi. I have to do my best in order to avenge my clan. The Ashi hummed. His eyes softened, but not in any way that was immediately obvious. That is a goal that I can get behind. As clan head, that sentiment would ring true to me if I were in your shoes. Though it may not seem it, I care for all those that call my clan their family. Sasuke scoffed. Even those in the branch family? The Ashi scowled, an action that made Sasuke stiffen all its own. Yes it's yeah. Even the branch family. I'm not sure you know, but my brother was in the branch family and I loved him dearly. My uncles and aunts were in the branch family and I loved them as well. Hiashi then breathed deeply, the action calming his nerves. The wrinkles on his face smoothed out and once more he looked like a porcelain statue. After a moment of silence the man opened his eyes. He didn't look as fierce, just weary. One day, one of my daughters will be in the branch family. Do you think I would not love her still? Sasuke shook his head. He had hit a nerve and knew when to concede. I think you would. I apologize, Lord Hayuga, I did not mean. The Ashi waved him off before he could finish. It is of no matter. Such things are in the past. I'm sure you are as inquisitive as any as to the matters of the Hayuga clan. Sasuke nodded but didn't respond. The room where they were training, Hiyashi's personal dojo, once more fell into a silence. After a while Sasuke couldn't hold it anymore and coughed. Yes it's yeah. Hiyashi asked. If I may, may I ask a question? Pertaining to what? Hiyashi asked. Your clan. The Ashi raised an eyebrow but didn't object, so Sasuke took that as his cue to continue. If you love your clan so much, then why do you continue to let half of them suffer under the effects of that seal? Sasuke asked. He had been spending a lot of time around the Hayuga while he was creating their new combined style. It was only a given that he would see the seals marring the heads of each branch family Hayuga. And don't tell me that it's just so you can protect the Byakugan. If that were the case, then even the main family would have the marks on their head. There is something deeper there. I can feel it. The Ashi, not expecting it, allowed his other eyebrow to raise. After a while the man digested the question and just like that the lines were crossing his face again and the man looked every bit his age. Possibly even older. That is a question that every past Hokage has asked every clan head of the Hayuga since the inception of the village. He Ashi sighed. It is not an easy question to answer. Sasuke frowned. Not an easy question. It doesn't seem too hard. You're the clan head, aren't you? Just abolish the darn thing. It is not as simple as you think, Hiyashi answered. His voice was tired, as if he had said the words and visited the subject far more times than was comfortable. There are certain regulations that must be observed and certain procedures that must be adhered to. Sasuke scoffed. Sounds like a bunch of bullshit if you ask me. The Achiha never had this kind of thing. We had meetings, sure, but the leader of the clan always had final word on the matters of affairs. And look where that has landed them. The air in the room tensed. Sasuke glared at Hiyashi, his red eyes trying their hardest to burn a hole in the older man's skull. Hiyashi, however, looked nonplussed. He almost seemed bored, though the slight clenching of his jar was as telltale to his anger as any other indication. I won't insult your clan if you won't insult mine. Hiyashi said, his voice tight and words measured. Sasuke nodded, though it took him a while to deactivate his eyes. I still think that it's bullshit, Sasuke muttered. The Ashi sighed, an action that was surprisingly common today, and turned from the boy to the door leading into the main section of the compound. If it eases any nerves, the older man said. Emotion had started to leak back into his voice. I, too, disagree with the current state of affairs. Then why let them continue? Sasuke asked. I've told you, boy. There are certain rules and regulations that must be observed. Traditions going generations back are not so easily undone. I would overturn them in a heartbeat had I the ability, but in doing so I would anger the elders of our clan. While they hold no particular power over me, they hold favor in the clan. Both main and branch house. My impulsive decision would tear the Hyuga clan apart. So no, as much as I would enjoy abolishing the system of oppression, I cannot both do so and maintain the stability of the clan. As clan head, my first duty is towards the survival of the clan that I love. 
It is not an action that I can do without threatening that survival. Sasu cuffed. He looked away from the older man and focused instead on catching his breath. Then just get rid of the elders. The ashy let a genuine, hard to mistake smile grace his face. If only things were that simple. Why are they such assholes, anyway? I suppose it is that they are mired in tradition. Why is tradition so important then? The ashy hummed. I suppose it is integral to human nature. Well, Sasuke started, if human nature is so disgusting, then maybe I should just stop being human. At this, Hiashi turned from the door he was about to open. His mouth opened, poised to ask the question so obviously hanging in the air, but suddenly snapped shut. Sasuke noticed the older man's faraway look. Is something wrong, Lord Hyuga? No, Hiashi said slowly. I mean, yes. I apologize, I haven't felt this is quite a long time. Sasuke, confused, let the man continue. I, I think my father's senses are tingling. Sasuke's face was deadpan. Your father senses. SHH, boy. Hiashi shushed. One or both of my daughters is in danger, and I need to figure out which one. The two stood in silence for a bit, Sasuke looking decidedly more confused about the situation than his counterpart. The Ichiha wanted to believe that the man in front of him really did have some sort of sense telling him that his daughters were in peril, but he just looked so weird. The Hyuga clan head was standing there on the corner of the room, waving his hands around like some sort of demented praying mantis. After a while more, the Hyuga snapped out of his trance. His mannerisms immediately defaulted back to his stoic nature, and the man once more turned to the door. With all the decorum afforded to him, he ashy slid the paper door open and prepared to step into the hall. Sasuke ran towards him, his incredulity not stopping him from finding out what was going on. Well. The ashy turned towards the boy. Hmm. Which one of your daughters are in danger? Oh, he ashy said. I am not sure. Sasuke gaped. But what about your father's senses? It is telling me that both are in some kind of danger. I know where Hanabi is supposed to be, she should be studying for the academy's entrance exams in the common room. Hanada, however, Sasuke nodded. I will go look for her. The ashy nodded. I am grateful for it, Icha. I will send other branch members to scout for her as well, but as far as I know she was supposed to be around the industrial district. She walks around there when she needs to clear her head. Understood, Sasuke said. And like that the two were off, Hiashi to check on his youngest daughter and Sasuke to hunt down his eldest. Sasuke, of course, jumped to the roof of the Hyuga compound. Higher elevation should help him to look for her. He wasn't expecting to find her immediately, but it should be a good stop. Is that a large green blob of sentient goo? Sasuke asked himself, his eyes immediately falling on the odd creature. Sasuke took a moment to assess it, then activated his Sharingan to make sure he wasn't seeing things incorrectly. Then, upon confirming that it was exactly what it seemed like, Sasuke shrugged and darted off after it. If that's not suspicious, then I don't know what is, Sasuke said aloud. Besides, it couldn't be any more weird than Hiashi's father senses, so Sasuke wasn't even afraid as he dashed over rooftops to the no doubt wicked monstrosity. Anada blinked once, then twice, as the gelatinous goo monster slowly oozed its way through the back alleys of the Hidden Leaf Village. She was entrapped, well mostly, inside of its gooey body. Her entire head and maybe some fingers and her hip poked out from the ooze occasionally, but overall she was pretty immobilized. Anada yawned. Hey, girl, the goo monster cried. Seeing as it was a monster and not a human, its voice came not from a mouth, but the entire gelatinous mass. It had an odd echoing quality to it, as if a normal person was talking from underneath a pool. Can you at least pretend to be afraid? Anada shrugged, or at least tried to. Despite the goo being liquid, it was incredibly viscous. She couldn't move much for anything while she was trapped inside of it, and it seemed to be sapping her chakra. But I'm not afraid, not really, Hinata said. I mean, this is pretty bad, but I've had worse. At least this time I'm not being kidnapped by the Hidden Cloud Village. The goo monster bristled, or at least, Hinata guessed that it did. I am a giant goo monster. Can you fear that, at least? Hinata, once again, shrugged. I've stopped being scared of things when I started dating the boy that would move mountains for me. The goo jiggled. In doing so it jostled Hinata, but that didn't mean much to the apathetic princess. The goo monster did not seem pleased by this. Well, started the monster. As romantic as that is, I doubt that he can hold a candle to me. Hinata looked at the beast. Right? It asked. Hinata shook her head. But I am the pinnacle of monster ingenuity. Hinata, once more, shook her head. Why? Because I wasn't being romantic. Or metaphoric. He literally moved the mountain for me. The goo made a sound that was almost a whine. Yeah, sure. Your boyfriend moved a whole mountain for you. Hinata was about to retort, but something slammed into the ground behind them. Slowly, the goo monster turned its gelatinous body around to see what had happened. Only to see a pink-haired girl slowly rise from the crater she had flung herself into. 
Okay, new plan, whenever I'm flying with telekinesis, don't go faster than 20 kilometers per hour from above the two-story line. Sakura then rubbed her forehead. Also, ow. The goo monster was stunned by the action. Hinata, however, was not. Telekinesis. Do you have psychic powers now, Sakura? Sakura looked at Hinata. Her face was almost a scowl as she looked at her former classmate. Yes. I see that you're as nonplussed as ever. She then stopped, and for a second her eyes went glossy. They returned to normal soon, however. And I see that you're lying, now. That's not a good face for the Hyuga princess. Hinata sweet innocent Hinata actually scoffed. It's a monster, Sakura. I'm pretty sure that my lack of decorum will be forgiven. The monster made a sound that was like a gurgle. It wasn't a very good lie, though. I mean, how could your boyfriend possibly move a mountain? Sakura let her eyes drift, for the first time, to the monster that was taking up most of the back alley. No, that happened. What didn't happen was the two of them becoming an item. Sakura looked back at Hinata. You're not dating Naruto. Hinata looked at Sakura. If it weren't for the fact that Hinata wasn't made with a mean bone in her body, Sakura might have interpreted the look as a glare. We are. He just doesn't know it yet. Sakura rubbed her forehead. I don't know what you see in him. He's practically emotionless half the time. Hinata huffed. She pointed her nose in the air as she looked away. Then you don't know him as well as I do. Sakura sighed. She massaged her temples before looking back to the goo monster. I, uh, I guess I'm sorry for dragging you into this. We've been having this argument for a while. Indeed, ever since Ino started hanging with the crazy trio, Sakura had struck up a very unsuspected friendship with Hinata. It's fine. The goo monster gurgled. If that is all, then I'll just leave. A blue film of telekinetic energy formed over both the goo monster and Hinata. Yeah, Sakura said. Her eyes were glowing the same icy blue as the energy that enveloped the two. I can't let that happen, either. Her dad would blow several fuses. The goo monster, unable to move, gurgled in a distressed way. But she doesn't even have a problem with this. Sakura looked to Hinata. She looked about as interested in the current events as she would be about the weather. Sakura looked back to the goo monster. Yeah, she doesn't. Do you want to know why? It's because her best friend would punch you so hard that your twisted descendants would feel it. Sakura stressed best friend while glaring at Hinata. Hinata tried to glare back, but it looked cute at best. The goo monster gurgled. Enough with the stupid best friend. Why are you so adamant about lying about him? I know that he's impossible. Actually, a voice echoed. It was familiar to both Sakura and Hinata. Sakura looked exasperated, and Hinata looked nonplussed. They're not lying. Sasuke Chiha jumped down from a building into the surprisingly empty alleyway. He wore the Hyuga training clothing, which was all white, but he still somehow managed to look gloomy. Sasuke took one look at the situation before turning to the one bastion of normalcy he could find. Himself. Dear God, I'm really standing here in this situation. Sasuke closed his eyes and stared upwards as if to imagine himself anywhere other than where he was. One of my former classmates is trapped in some kind of sludge monster, who is in turn trapped in a telekinetic field of one of my other teammates. Sasuke groaned. This is happening. Greetings, Ichiha. Hinata greeted with a small smile. Is training with father over? Why, yes. Sasuke responded. He returned the smile, though his was more of a smirk. His father senses seemed to go off, and we had to end the experiment early. Hinata almost seemed to pale at that, but she took the information in stride. I see. Sasuke turned to Sakura. So, psychic now? I'm a telekinetic right now, Sakura responded. We'll see about reading minds in a bit. Sasuke smirked. He turned to the goo monster. Well, I guess it's time to show you what I've been working on. I haven't exactly been sitting still. Sasuke then got into an odd stance. His knees bent, putting him into a crouch. With one hand outstretched and the other held back, he turned slightly sidelong to the enemy and bent his fingers into slight claws. I will show you the power of the water-flowing rock-crushing fist. Sakura smiled. She then raised her hand towards the goo monster. Not if I crush it first. The goo monster took that moment to break free of the telekinesis. It gurgled once, before letting goo tentacles burst out of its body. You will not take my prize. I will take you all instead. And with that, the three charged towards each other. What if neglected Naruto was sent in one punch man? Thanks for watching my video till the end if you enjoy this content, then do consider subscribing to my channel, and leave a like if you guys need the next part, comment down, and thanks for watching the video and see you guys in the next video.